Act One of The Hobby Horse by Arthur Wing Pinero. This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. The Hobby Horse The Persons of the Play Mr. Spencer German, read by Son of the Exiles. Mrs. Spencer German, read by Sonia. Mr. Pinching, read by Adrian Stevens. Miss Moxon, read by Devorah Allen. The Reverend Noel Bryce, read by Todd. Bertha, read by Jen Broda. Tom Clark, read by Thomas Peter. Mrs. Porcher, read by Lydia. Mr. Shattuck, read by Kristen Hand. Mr. Pews, read by Alan Mapstone. Mr. Lyman, read by Adam Bielka. Mr. Malta, read by Bandana Man 99. Mrs. Landon, read by AMB Suite 13. Tiny Landon, read by by Bandana Man 99. Hewitt read by Schrum. Stage directions read by Michael Meggs. The first act, a chapter of philanthropy. The second act, a chapter of sentiment. The third act, a chapter of expiation. The hobby horse. The first act, a chapter of philanthropy. The scene is the garden and exterior of a picturesque old country house, with gables and porch all overgrown with flowers, the residence of Mr. Spencer German. It is a bright May morning. Shattuck comes cautiously along the garden walk, followed by pews. Shattuck is a bony, ungainly-looking man of about forty, with high shoulders, rounded back, close-cropped head set forward, and a sallow, keen-eyed face. Pews is a snub-nosed, red-faced, fat little man. Both are dressed horsily, and have a very broken-down appearance. Shattuck, turning sharply upon Pews. Shh! Can't you turn off that music? Pews, panting and wiping his forehead. No, I cannot. If you allude to my breathing a bit heavy. You're a nice broken-winded gentleman to bring out on a quiet, delicate expedition. Didn't I tell you, Edward Pews, that it ain't our book to meet the ladies? Breathe in your at, man. Breathe in your at. You knew I was a roarer when you brought me here, Samuel. I have been so ever since I got ducked at Doncaster in 84. Shattuck, crouching on the steps and looking into the house. There they are. I see them. All of them. Having their morning feed. Mr. Spencer German is a-glancing at the newspaper. A little curious about the prices for the Grand Prix, apparently. Mrs. German is a-toying with a hag. Oh, you beauty. Who's the other? Oh, Miss Moxon, the lady staying in the house, makes a bad third. All right, German will show directly. He said he'd be happy to see myself and friend this morning at 10 a.m. Did he? Then why the deuce are we sneaking up to his house, hugging the rails instead of taking the middle of the course fair and open? I'll tell you, Edward, then perhaps you'll breathe a little peacefuller. You've seen this here, Spencer German? At pretty nigh every race meeting for the last ten years. I've seen him at Lincoln, I've seen him at Liverpool, I see him at the Epsom Spring, I've seen him here at Newmarket, I've seen him at the Epsom Summer, I've seen him... Very well, you see him. That's enough. Do you know the party in question? I can't say we've ever chummed, but I've heard him classed as a generous patron of the turf 
and a good and game thoroughbred Henglish gent. You've hit it. You've enumerated Spencer German's points more than accurate. He's a man what loves the horse and all them what has to do with the horse. He loves racing and sport and pluck, and he's got an open hand for any broken-down sportsman. Some say that intellectually Mr. Spencer German wouldn't pass the vet. Well, I ain't going to howl about that. If Spencer German takes a lovin' fancy to Samuel Shattuck, ex-jockey, ex-trainer, ex-bookmaker, hex, hex, hex Welsher. That's a friendly comment, Edward. Looking into the house. Hello, there's Sturin. But you haven't told me, Sam, why you want to fight shy of the women folk. Why? Because Mr. Spencer German has gone and married a lady who don't know a horse from a am sandwich, a female with no more love and sympathy for the turf than them what lives by it than, than the chaplain of York Prison. Hush! Drop a whale over the pass, Sam. Always keep out of the way of the ladies, Mr. Shattuck, says German to me. Mrs. German has no eyes for anything but her little ragged urchins. What's he mean by that? Why, he's married a woman with a craze. She's a... 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 philanthropist. Crikey! Never happy but what she's picking up dirty little boys and girls and taking them home and washing and combing them and giving them cake and sermon. As if his philanthropy wasn't as good as her philanthropy. As if we didn't want washing and combing as much. A more than the dirtiest boys and girls in England. Look out! Mrs. Landon, a poor widow, comes up the walk, leading Tiny Landon, a small boy. There, what did I tell you? Here's one of Mrs. German's little devils, ready to take the bread out of an honest man's mouth. Shattuck steps forward to meet Mrs. Landon. I beg your pardon, sir. I want for to see the lady, Mrs. German. Tall, fair lady? Went down that there avenue about twenty minutes ago. Am I correct in what I am saying, Mr. Pews? I certainly see a tall fair lady going down the avenue a carrying a red plush bag with a monogram on it. Ah, uh, but she told me not to fail to bring my little boy this morning. I am that disappointed. She was similarly anxious for to see Mr. Pews. I have brought him miles and miles. We're all in the same basket, seems to me. Hewitt, a groom, comes from the house to Pews and Shattuck. Hello, what do you want? We're a waiting for to see Mr. German, Mr. Hewitt. Don't hasten him, sir. Our time's our own. Ah, oh, good morning, Mrs. Landon. Mistress said I was to take you and Tiny to her room. Directly you came. These gentlemen thought they saw her go out. They must have been mistaken. Taint the first time in their lives they've been mistaken, I dare say. Come along on me. Mrs. London follows Hewitt up the steps to the house. Shattuck, cuffing Tiny, who runs after his mother. You get shown in, do you? You pushing little cad. Mr. German, a smart, dapper little man of forty-five or fifty, with a sporting appearance, comes through the porch and meets Hewitt, Mrs. London and Tiny on the steps. Oh, Mrs. Landon, how do you do? Getting over your trouble? Slowly, sir. Your boy doesn't grow much. Put him into a stable and make a jockey of him. Mrs. Landon and Tiny go inside with Hewitt. Lord bless me, another rackety little imp running about the place. We're swarming with them. Ah, if my scheme should by any chance satisfy Diana's philanthropic cravings, what a relief it would be. Shattuck, meeting German as he descends the steps. Good morning, Mr. Spencer German, sir. Ah, oh, Mr. Shattuck, you're punctual, I'm glad to see. Yes, Mr. German, sir, and I ventured for to bring with me the other deserving case I mentioned. Mr. Hedward Pews. Formerly a boy in John Gorton's stable, he rode hysteria for Lord Oscott in the hoax so far back as 56, being suspended from riding at Goodwood in 61 on an unjust charge of horrid language at the post, 
he took to drink and put on flesh rapid. In proof whereof, I ask you to look at him. Since that time, he has been various, but never lucky. He... All right, all right. What has he been doing lately? Selling tips in envelopes, sir, and doing poorly. My voice not telling after the first hour. Can he refer me to anybody? Can he refer you to anybody? Can I refer you to anybody? Oh. Shattuck, admiringly. Can you refer him to anybody? They look uneasily at each other. Can he refer you to... Huh. Well, in a sort of way, Mr. Pews gives me as a reference. Oh, well, I'll make inquiries. All I can say for the present is I don't dislike your friend's face. Pews wipes his face carefully with a dirty handkerchief. And now I'd better explain, Mr. Shattuck, why I desired to see you this morning. Sit down. Don't mind me. Sit down. Shattuck and Pews sit side by side on a garden bench. I will walk about. I'm so excitedly interested in my scheme that I really can't discuss it sitting down. We will hear you out, sir. We will hear you out. You're a gentleman, sir. None better. My scheme is this. Mrs. German, my wife, is a lady of a most charitable disposition. It is my fault entirely that I have comparatively little sympathy with the precise form of her generosity. However, that's nothing to do with you, my men. Go on, sir. We're earing you. Mrs. German, on the other hand, has no feeling for anything or anybody connected with the turf or the stable. No feeling except one of positive distaste. Shame! Shame! How dare you employ that ejaculation in reference to Mrs. German, sir? What do you mean by it, eh? Shattuck to Pews. Now I hope you're proud of yourself. Mrs. German's prejudices are quite beyond not only the censure, but the comprehension of such as ourselves. Shattuck to Pews. Because your face gets flattered and you go and lose your head. But I think, Mr. Shattuck, that I have discovered a method of blending Mrs. German's notions of philanthropy with a pet plan of my own to benefit some of the waifs and strays connected with the noble pastime which is more than my hobby, which is my existence. Well spoken. There is a farmhouse of mine, which has been vacant for a long time, about five miles from here, at Shodley Heath. A very commodious, well-built dwelling. Perhaps you know it. A house painted yellow or cream colour? That's it. Seeing German take out a cigar, Shatter and Pews simultaneously produce their clay pipes. Now my notion is to fit and furnish this house substantially and usefully, and to endow it as a home for about twenty decayed jockeys and stablemen, Men like yourselves, who have outlived their chances on the turf and fallen on bad days. Yeah, Mr. Shattuck, what do you think of that? Tell me, mister, are you entering us for the temperance stakes? How dare you put a question like that? Where's your gratitude for the bare idea? I was a-thinking of Mr. Pews. Too little is as bad as too much for a man like Edward Pews. We'll discuss that by and by. The point is, Mr. Shattuck, can you find twenty men who would be willing to lead honest, sober, decent lives? Well, offhand, I shouldn't like for to pledge myself to such an undertaking. Men with some good sterling qualities in them, behind all their faults and weaknesses. Well, you see, I dare say I've rather spoilt you by showing you me and Mr. Pews first. However, you leave this ear to me. And if there is on the face of this year earth twenty honest, broken-down sportsmen willing for to be kept free and liberal, I'll bring them to the post fit and fine. Thank you. Thank you. It's a grand scheme. I long to break it to Mrs. German. If she takes to it, why, <laughs> who knows, we may see her at Ascot yet. Pinching, 
a pleasant but rather weak-looking young man in riding costume, comes up the walk. How are you, Jermyn? My dear Pinching. I'm behind my time. The mare lost her shoe, so I had to leave her at Lassingham and walk on. Are these two gentlemen two of your protégés? Yes. You're smiling, Pinching. Don't, my boy, don't. I can't get you to treat this matter with professional earnestness. Um, Mr. Shattuck, this is Mr. Ralph Pinching of Newmarket, my solicitor. The men bow uncomfortably. Oh, crikey. Here's an element to creep in. Now, my men, I am leaving here this morning, almost immediately, and it is possible that I shall be away for nearly a month. But during my absence, Mr. Shattuck, you will communicate with Mr. Pinching as if he were myself. He has my full instructions. Hewitt comes from the house. Hewitt, don't forget, I go to town by the 12.15. Put Romper in the cart. Yes, sir. And give these men something to eat and drink. Shattuck to Hewitt. Now you've got to show us in. Yes, kitchen. Cad. Hewitt goes towards the house with Shatter and Pews. And now, my dear German, I've something really serious to talk to you about. Good gracious, Pinching. Serious? Yes. You shall find me your man of business in real earnest for a few moments. Lord bless me, Pinching, you don't mean... That I have some news of your boy, Alan? Yes, I think so. My boy, my boy, get on, sir, get on. For heaven's sake, don't go to sleep about it. It isn't that I'm in a hurry to hear anything of that scamp of a boy, but I have to catch the 12.15. God bless him. Pinching produces a pocketbook. Now tell me, German, when did you quarrel and part with your son? I particularly want dates. Certainly. It was just before the Middle Park plate. No, no, please, legally, that is not a perfect date. Well, it was about six months before my marriage to Diana. And you married the present Mrs. German a little over a year ago. Come, that's better. Turning over some papers. Now, about the time this quarrel occurred, I find that a young man named Thomas Clark shipped himself on board the steamship Penguin, bound for the Australian ports as a common sailor. Pah! On the wrong scent! That wouldn't be my boy, Alan. This Thomas Clark left some clothes behind him at a lodging in the east of London. Alan wouldn't have done that. On the wrong scent, sir. The landlady subsequently sought the advice of the police as to her right to dispose of this property. It was ultimately sold but there exists a memorandum on the police books that some articles of apparel belonging to Mr. Thomas Clark were marked A.J. That's my boy. I fancied it might be. Fancy? There's no fancy about it. You surely haven't let the matter drop. My dear Pinching, you are neglecting this business altogether. I could have managed it better myself. It's not professional. Pray be calm, German, and hear me out. Excuse me, Pinching. I am much obliged to you for your energy in this affair. Go on. It appears that the boy signed articles with the owners to make four voyages in the Penguin. And did he? Thomas Clark did, and finally discharged himself at the East India docks about a month ago. And where's he now? That is just what I am trying to find out. Trying to find out? Rubbish, sir! What I mean to find out, if I can. Spencer German, taking Pinching's hand. Thank you, old fella. You're a good friend. Bring my boy back to me again, Pinching, for two reasons. Two reasons? Well, in the first place, Diana has never seen him, and a woman ought to know what her son is like. And secondly, Pinching, in our quarrel, the boy was right and I was wrong. Dear me. It was a serious business. He fancied Medusa for the Middle Park Plate, and I had a strong liking for King Carraway. But he said that King Carraway wasn't fit to run without a respirator, 
and that irritated me pinching and we had hot words and i saw him go out at that gate sir and we never met again and next day when i watched the racing i was still so indignant pinching that i could hardly steady my glasses but the boy was right god bless him and i want to tell him what i felt when i saw that confounded king carraway go to pieces at the abingdon dip sir while medusa my dear boy's fancy romped in like a ballet girl miss moxel a prettily dressed young lady appears in the porch mr pinching oh how do you do miss moxon mrs german wants to know if you have breakfasted ah uh, yes thank you <laughs> oh do come in it is almost my last hour in odlem house mr pinching i'm going away this morning for good going away no miss moxon to german will you give poor unfortunate me a lift to the station to catch the twelve fifteen mr german i'm sorry to assist at your departure miss moxon however i'll tell hewitt we'll go over in the carriage german leaves them and directly he is out of sight miss moxon runs down the steps and pinching takes her hand coming away miss moxon yes isn't it awful and i am so happy here with diana i feel i shall never be happy again mr pinching never 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 but why are you going miss moxon sitting it is my duty pinching sitting close beside her duty duty german returns quickly oh by the by pinching pinching and miss moxon rise guiltily all three are embarrassed ah i just wanted to say um ugh. looking at miss moxon excuse me pinching won't you certainly german don't tell mrs german this morning of our discoveries about my boy alan certainly not if you don't wish it it is rather a sore subject between us diana always points to the loss of my boy as one of the evil results of horse racing and as i'm just going to divulge my scheme for the jockey's home at shoddley heath i particularly want her to be in a good temper today that's all pinching looking at miss moxon excuse my my awkwardness won't you charming woman miss moxon um i shan't see you again for five minutes pinchin german goes into the house miss moxon strolling towards pinching were you saying anything to me mr pinching when dear mr german came back oh yes why is it specially your duty to run away from friends who who like you so well miss moxon why don't you know that i am a very very poor woman mr pinching that i had nothing a year settled on me by my parents who died almost before i was born and that i have been some sort of a governess ever since i could lisp and shall remain one till i am qualified for an almshouse no i only know that you were a schoolfellow of mrs jermyn's and that you have been a guest at odlam house for the last three weeks and that uh, and that yes and that my legal visits to mr jermyn have lately been very protracted thank you you're the only lawyer i've ever known as well as this you are the only governess i have ever known as well as this i never imagined a lawyer was so young oh yes it's only in books that we suffer from chronic old age after today when i am far far away from odlam house i shall always think pleasantly of a lawyer and i shall always think pleasantly of a governess of governesses in general do you mean or a governess a governess miss moxon looking away then do you know any other governess no oh mrs jermyn a stately handsome woman of about thirty appears at the top of the steps leading tiny london by the hand won't you come into the house mr pinching constance dear you said you would look after mr pinching i am doing so diana mrs jermyn and tiny come down the steps as miss moxon and pinching ascend thank you mrs jermyn 
Am I too old to compete with this young gentleman for a permanent location at Odlam House? Ah, uh, Mr. Pinching, don't you be unsympathetic. I fear my husband's indifference is contagious. Go in, please. I am looking for Mr. German. Miss Moxon and Pinching go into the house. Mrs. German goes down upon her knees before the child, smoothing his hair and polishing his face with her handkerchief. There, my dear little fellow, the sight of you ought to soften any man's heart. Where is Spencer? Ah, tiny, if you could but realise it, the success of a grand, a beautiful scheme depends upon the impression you make upon Mr. German. Tiny London, trying to avoid the pocket handkerchief. Oh, don't! German enters and contemplates Mrs. German and the child with annoyance. Here's one of those beastly little boys. Diana, my darling, I'm afraid I shall have to say goodbye very soon. And when am I to see you again, Spencer? Hmm. Well, Diana, as you know, I'm going to Paris tonight for the Altaya steeple chase. Oh. I shall remain over there till after the Grand Prix. Oh. And then, my dear, I suppose I had better... Return home, Spencer? Well, Diana, I was about to say that I'd better then, um, push on to Ascot. And have you been as precise in your arrangements for my occupation, Spencer? Certainly, certainly. I have thought a great deal about that. In fact, I, uh, that is, well, my darling, I understood that old Mrs. Hetherington had been pressing about your staying in Hans Place. It's the London season, you know. <laughs> There can be no season anywhere for a wife without her husband. My dear Diana, I am delighted to hear you say that. I do leave you a great deal. I am always flying here, there and everywhere. It is wrong. It is damnably wrong. Mrs. German, holding her hands over Tiny's ears. Spencer, the child. Ugh! I beg your pardon, Diana, but confound that ugly child. Oh, no. I repeat, it is wrong that I should go about in this way alone. Therefore, let us remedy it. Willingly. Ah, that's right, my darling. But I fear, Spencer, that you overestimate your powers of resolve in thinking that you can forego those dreadful race meetings. My dear Diana, I don't suggest that. I was about to propose that you accompany me. Spencer, pray respect me a little. Tiny sits at the foot of a tree with a book. Husbands and wives are seen together at these places. What grade of wife? What grade of wife? Why, the, the, the ordinary sort of married wife? Then I am not the ordinary sort of wife. I confess I may possess one faculty less than other women. That faculty is the stable. The stable in all its bearings and influences, public and private. Diana, this is simple prejudice. What is a stable? Your own stable, for which you so often leave me. It is the least comfortable part of our premises, where common men are always shouting, get back, or come over, and carrying about pails of water. It isn't the stable, Diana. It's the horses, the noble, intelligent horses. The only use you find for them is to drag you or carry you from one place to another. Don't they do it well? Certainly. Then let it end there. When a train does the same thing in an eighth of the time, you don't pet the steam engine and smoke pipes with the railway directors. And then, these dreadful festivals called the races. The races, where you put the very animal you profess to respect and admire to a speed it was never meant to attain, 
and where your jockey lashes and wounds the beast he rides because the poor thing is too fragile to make the pace or too intelligent to risk breaking a blood vessel the races a mere bacchanal of vulgarity and depravity whose vice sinks into a man until his very tongue becomes furred with it and he can speak only in the shibboleth of the betting ring my dear sport is the natural wear of men like his coat and trousers it is perfectly becoming that a woman should not adopt the one or the other spencer the instinct of sport is born in us in all possibility adam had a gun license and as there were horses in eden there you have the origin of ascot it was the presence of eve which made it a ladies meeting hush spencer the child racing is my hobby my weakness if you like bless my soul and body you have a hobby which is a weakness and pray what is that spencer spencer german pointing to tiny there's an animated fraction of it over there there are four or five more of em stabled i beg your pardon diana domiciled in our house at the moment i don't bring my horses indoors a few local orphans happen to be occupying the nursery you know you must be aware that we have no other use for the nursery my dear diana if we are to argue let us argue respectfully and fairly i admit spencer that i am absorbingly interested in little boys to wander freely through the courts and alleys of the most wretched districts of london finding small human treasures amongst the flotsam and jetsam of the great metropolis is the furthermost ambition my mind can grasp promise me spencer promise me that when the summer is gone and the chill misery of the wet winter is upon us that you will spend a day with me in poplar no diana certainly not any day in bond street oh you are odious our own parish of over lessingham contains enough poverty to satisfy any moderate philanthropist do what you like here spencer you mean that you give me permission to do what i please in lessingham for the welfare of our poor people certainly my darling and i was about to tell you of an idea of mine for enlarging your scheme of operations oh you dear old darling sit down there and i'll sit at your feet as i used to before we before we before we were philanthropists before we were married and i'll give you back your old nickname of nettles thank you diana mrs german pinching his chin good humoured irritable irritating old nettles and i'll tell you all about the great big plan i've had in my poor anxious head for weeks and weeks and weeks do my darling and then you shall hear my proposition which i fancy hush nettles dear you do rattle on so i beg your pardon my darling nettles dear yes diana i don't believe we shall ever get a tenant for that farmhouse at shodley heath Hey? it has been vacant so long why should we not ourselves turn it into account well now that's a little strange the same notion had already struck me oh you dear old nettles i know nettles has been having what he calls a good time of it at that awful epsom and yet i'm not angry with him well then dear this is my plan the children are in the way at odlem house in your way i mean i certainly are and when they all have the whooping cough it will be distressing to nettle's ear now why shouldn't we furnish the shodley heath farm diana turn mrs clegg our old housekeeper into a sort of matron and make the farmhouse a refuge for thirty or forty of my little waifs my dear diana to a very great extent my plan is yours oh 
I had already determined to furnish the farm for benevolent purposes. Tiny, Tiny London, come here. The child runs across to her. She wipes his nose. Oh, you precious little charge. Tiny, kiss the gentleman and make oh so much of him. She places the child on Jermyn's knee. He struggles and pushes Tiny from him. Diana, you won't let me explain. I certainly have arranged that the farm at Shodley should be a home or refuge, but pardon me, Diana, not, not for little boys. What? Not for little boys? No, Diana. For little girls? No, Diana. For whom, then, is Shodley to be a shelter? I thought it would satisfy and delight you, Diana. Twenty decayed jockeys. Oh. Shattuck and Pews lounge out of the house with pipes in their mouths. Shattuck to Pews. Ants off, the Duchess. Are these two of them? Samuel Shattuck, a friend of his? They are indeed decayed. Diana, remember they were, both of them, little boys once. Pinching and Miss Moxon, talking earnestly, come out of the house. Spencer German, angrily to shatter Pews. Do try to make a favourable impression upon the ladies, please. Put those pipes away. They touch their hats and tap the contents of their pipes against the heels of their boots. Miss Moxon, quietly to Mrs. German. Diana, I'm almost a happy woman. I'm quite a wretched one. I really think Ralph Pinching is in love with me. Miss Moxon walks away ecstatically, Pinching looking after her. Oh, Pinching, I want you to enter into my scheme with Mrs. German. Quietly. Be sanguine about it. Pinching pays no attention. Pinching! Hey? Oh, yes. Taking German's arm. German, Miss Moxon's father was a captain in the Lancers. Yes, yes, my boy. Pinching joins Miss Moxon and begins talking earnestly. I wish to goodness Pinching would be more professional. Pinching, Pinching, my boy, Mrs. German wants to hear your notions about the home. Eh? Oh, yes, great fun. Mr. Pinchin, I claim your attention for a few minutes, please. Certainly. Spencer German, pointing to a rustic table. There, a pen, ink and paper. Pinching whispers to Miss Moxon, then seats himself at the table. She takes a chair by his side, and they continue talking. Diana, pray sit down. As she is about to sit, Shattuck hurries forward and dusts the seat with his handkerchief. One moment, lady. There, lady. Mrs. German, shrinking from him. Uh, thank you. She sits with Tiny by her side. The more I look at you, lady, the more I see the likeness to my poor missus. Pointing to Mrs. German. Do you catch it, Edward? Striking. To your first, missus. What do you mean, going on like that? I mean the missus you had when I first knew you, Sam. Hush, hush, hush. Diana, my dear, I want you to understand, and so does Mr. Pinchin. To Pinching, who is engaged with Miss Moxon. Pinchin! that all the thoughtfulness, all the charity of this notion has been animated by your beautiful, your magnificent example in dealing with little boys. That child is tearing your gown, Diana. Box his ears! Box his ears! But Diana, as Pinching aptly reminds us, Pinching, please! As Pinching aptly reminds us, the world is not exclusively peopled by little boys. Is it peopled with anything more innocent, more precious than little boys? Hmm. No, my dear. 
But you oughtn't to concentrate innocence on shoddly hoof. You ought to defuse it. Now men like Mr. Shattuck, step a little forward, Shattuck, my wife can't see you well. Men like Mr. Shattuck are victims of lost opportunities. True, lady. Mr. Shattuck was once a jockey of considerable promise. I was brought low, lady, by being got at by the wealthy and unscrupulous. Whenever I had a good mount, lady, and stood a chance of being in the one, two, three, I was always got at, lady. Examine the knuckle. Muscles of that end, lady. Mrs. German shrinks back. You may take my end and yours, lady. That end is developed through pulling, pulling hard. What do you mean, man? Pulling a horse's head when he was a-doing too well, lady, riding for to lose. Ah, lady, there's many a good horse what Sam Shattuck has rode what had toothache in his back teeth for years following. And see the end of it. Those there horses have come to cabs and me to a home on Shodley Eath. And it's a moral lesson, I say, and proud I am to preach it. You see, Diana, we have found some good here, I venture to think. At least you have developed an extraordinary talent for discovery. I wonder how it will strike Mr. Pilkington, the vicar. Oh, I've a fine plan for managing Pilkington. Have you? His poor wife would be glad to know it. I shall conciliate Pilkington by appointing a salaried warden. Not a clergyman. Certainly. Oh, crikey. A young, liberal-minded sportin' parson. Oh. Here, mister. I shan't ever get no twenty men to the post if a parson's gonna hold the flag. Silence! I've never met so much senseless opposition. Here, mister. Shattuck and Pews, you can go. Shattuck to Mrs. German. Speak for us, lady. Don't let him get his head in here. Pull him, lady, pull him. Oh, here's another element creep in. Shatter confused takes her leave. One would think I was a little boy. No, by Jove, I should be better treated if I were. Pinching, Mr. Pinching. Miss Moxon, please, really. Pinching, snatching up a pen and arranging a sheet of paper. I'm waiting for you, Chairman. The advertisement for the clerical papers. She sends Tiny away. Spencer German, dictating. Shodley E. Thane. <laughs> After all my plans. Opportunity for a young churchman in sympathy with our national sports and pastimes? There is no such man in existence. And there ought to be. The founder... Miss Moxon and Pinching are talking again. Pinching! Miss Moxon! Pon my word, I... The founder desires the cooperation as warden of an open-minded, unprejudiced... <laughs> Mr. Pinching, will you oblige me by following me into the house with your papers? Diana, your behaviour pains and vexes me. He ascends the steps and disappears through the porch. Pinching follows with the writing materials. Miss Moxon following Pinching. Is this then to be our goodbye? I'm very sorry to have to run away. You won't think me rude, will you? Do leave your address. Spencer German returning. Mr. Pinching! Pinching to Miss Moxon. Excuse me. He follows German hastily into the house. Leave my address? What an end to everything. Leave my address? It's abominable. One would think Mr. German did it on purpose to spoil my prospects. Mr. German would do anything to spoil anybody's prospects. Mine particularly. I ask, how is it possible for a woman to get married? Would it were not possible? A woman's only chance of happiness is in remaining single. I quite agree with you. But I shouldn't mind being wretched with Mr. Pinching. I can't talk to you about Mr. Pinching, Constance. 
I can't talk or think of anything but the blow which has fallen upon me. Don't consider me unsympathetic, Diana, but I can't talk to you about your blow. To think that he sat upon this very seat, and with the words, Constance, my darling, in his heart, was set to draw up an advertisement. To think that this is the end of all my dreams for the last few weeks, day and night. This is the end of my pleasant picture of forty babbling babies rolling upon the grass at Shodley, filling the diamond casements of the farmhouse with their fresh ruddy faces, or making its old rooms ring with the rattle of their metal spoons. Oh! At the very moment of my life when I am not getting younger, at the very instant I am starting to London to a nasty, humiliating situation, it's not giving him a chance, poor fellow my little boys my poor little boys but this is a grown-up man ah oh, you don't worship little children i could i want to but not so much other people's the home i could make for them the home i could make for him sitting distractedly upon the steps oh let people come and trample on me i don't care Constance, dear, don't. Mr. Pinching may write to you. No, he's a lawyer. He naturally wouldn't commit his views to paper. Then why not delay your journey to London? That's impossible. I gave my word a month ago that I would go to Mr. Bryce this week at latest, and today is the last day of the week, and the 12.15 is the only train to get me there by tea time. Mr. Bryce? who and what is mr bryce i've never seen him he is the curate of the very poorest parish in london st jacob's in the east that's all i know the poorest parish in london mr bryce has met with some accident and is going away for a holiday and i am to look after his niece in his absence and help with the horrid district visiting help with the horrid district visiting oh how glorious how beautiful how hateful! How odious! To you comes the opportunity that is denied to me, and you despise it. St. Jacob's in the East. The East. The very Mecca of the pilgrimage I have dreamed of. Oh, if I could but be in your place. Diana. Well? Diana, would you like to be in my place, really? Constance. This Mr. Bryce doesn't know me has never seen me. I answered his advertisement in the Seraphim when I was in London, and he didn't even trouble to take up my references. He expects a Miss Moxon today, not later than four o'clock. That's all. If you desperately wish it, why shouldn't you be Miss Moxon for two or three weeks? Oh, Mr. German would never allow it. He will not be here. When he returns, you have been visiting. There's the explanation. The children in the nursery... Leave me to look after the little darlings. Oh, Connie, I dare not play such a trick. Ah, when you were courting, I helped you. Besides, you forget everything. How can I travel to town in the train with Spencer? Oh, I never thought of that. Oh, Ralph, Ralph, why didn't you speak when you had the opportunity? I know. Di, I can get you to town by the 12.15. Be quiet, Constance. Who would take me to the station? Your husband. He would know I'm not going visiting without any luggage. He shan't know you're going to town today at all. You're quite mad, Constance. Never was saner in my life. The voices of German and Pinching are heard within. Make a careful copy of it, Pinching. Your husband and my Pinching. Go indoors and wait till I come. Pinching and German come from the house, the latter dressed for travelling. Constance, mind. I can't. I won't. Goodbye, Diana. I feel sure you will have grown to like my plans for Shodley Eath home. By the time I get back, we... we part affectionately, I hope, Diana. Certainly, Spencer. Goodbye, dear. Goodbye. They shake hands. Goodbye, my darling. Don't sit in any draughts. Goodbye. Mrs. German turns away. 
my dear miss moxon you will never be ready to drive with me to the station oh thank you mr german but my arrangements are altered diana has persuaded me not to go today constance i'm very glad but there is somebody i want you to take with you to the station not in the carriage of course let her ride on the box with gibbs will you certainly who is it poor mrs landon who is obliged to go to london on business oh she runs into the house diana's run away ah poor diana i'll go after her she follows mrs german into the house you'll telegraph to me german from time to time in case i should want to get at you suddenly won't you yes but pinching do you know that i've half a mind to let the steeplechase and the grand prix go to the devil and stop at home diana disappointed poor girl and lonely eh pinching well miss moxon remains a little longer and then there are the children that's true confound those children hewitt enters gibbs has taken the carriage round sir all right tell em i'm waiting hewitt goes into the house good-bye pinching it doesn't strike you that i'm a bad husband to diana does it a brute does it pinching eh my dear german don't think of such a thing poor diana hewitt comes out of the house carrying a travelling bag and rug have to look sharp to catch the twelve fifteen sir of course of course where is that mrs landon mrs landon mrs landon miss moxon enters from the house followed by mrs german in mrs langdon's black shawl and bonnet and veil come along mrs landon come along turning to pinching remember pinching he speaks in an undertone to pinching miss moxon to mrs german giving her an envelope the reverend noel bryce number eight pelican place great raggett street east i'll send your luggage off tonight oh. but where's diana surely she'll walk with me to the gate oh i she i won't leave her like this confound the train i'll go back and kiss her uh mr german she's in the nursery with the boys oh the deuce say i left my love look sharp hewitt german goes away followed by hewitt mrs german hurrying after them pinching detains miss moxon miss moxon i shall be here on business tomorrow at eleven o'clock may i see you miss moxon about to follow mrs german oh indeed you may mr pinching i wish to ask you a question which concerns my happiness i i what's the matter miss moxon gives a slight scream and waves her hands towards the house as if to keep someone from coming out no no not yet mrs landon without a bonnet or shawl runs from the house looking about her mrs landon where's my boy i can't find my tiny anywhere she hurries away good gracious isn't that widow landon why german thinks she's riding on the box seat german miss moxon obstructing his way no no mr pinching don't don't pinching trying to pass her excuse me miss moxon german ought to know of this german he passes miss moxon she clings to him no no mr pinching i i'll tell you something i'll be back in a moment no you mustn't what shall i do mr pinching i i, I love you mr pinching oh my dear miss moxon they sink onto the garden seat side by side end of act one of the hobby horse by arthur wing Pinero. Act Two of The Hobby Horse by Arthur Wing Pinero. This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. The Second Act 
A CHAPTER OF SENTIMENT The scene is two rather commonly furnished sitting rooms, separated by folding doors in a dull, sombre lodging house in the east end of London. Through the back windows is seen a large, gloomy church. It is the dwelling place of the Reverend Noel Bryce. The Reverend Noel Bryce, a pale, careworn-looking young man, is writing at a table with his wrist bound up while his niece, Bertha, a pretty girl of about sixteen, is seen through the folding doors making tea in the further room. Noel Bryce, as he writes. Now the question you must ask yourself is, what is philanthropy? Because if it be not a mere nickname for some crazy idiosyncrasy of the rich, there is no reason why you poor people should not be true philanthropists. He leans back wearily. <sighs> How this wretched wrist throbs, to be sure. Bertha comes from the further room. Uncle Noel, isn't Tom, uh, isn't Mr. Clark coming downstairs to drink tea with us this evening? Noel Bryce, resuming writing. I don't know, Bertha dear. We can't expect the boy to be always gossiping here. Bertha to herself. But he said my tea was the best in the world. It doesn't sound like a thing a man would say if he didn't mean it. To Noel. How many sermons for Sunday, Uncle Noel? Two. Dr. Porcher is too unwell to preach. Which are you working at now? The second. Oh, then you're nearly finished. No, dear. I always begin with the second. Rest your hand a little while and let me be your amanuensis. No, thank you, Lady Bird. I'll wait till Miss Moxon comes in. Bertha to herself. He never lets me help him, and I'm his niece. Why does he like dictating to Miss Moxon and not to me? He has only known her about nine or ten days, and she is no relation at all. Mrs. German enters in walking costume. Here's Miss Moxon, Noel. Mrs. German, kissing Bertha. Have I been out a very long time? It seems so. Where have you been doing good this afternoon? Nowhere. I have been attempting to visit Tyke's Court. Not alone? No. I met the young gentleman who lodges upstairs, Mr. Clark, and he went with me. Bertha to herself. My Tom. And what is your opinion of Tyke's Court? It is an unsavory locality which will see me no more. I cry beaten, Mr. Bryce. I have failed again today. Failed? In what, Miss Moxon? Failed to come up to my own aspirations. For days and days I have peered in at the opening of Tyke's Court and felt it my duty to tread a path through its decomposed cabbage leaves. I have made innumerable cowardly excuses. One day I have felt not well, another I had left my camphor at home, and so on. This afternoon I plunged. Oh, the horror of it! Are you going to faint? Mr. Clark asked me. I think so, I whispered. Get me out! Only get me out! He got me out, and I sat down in a chemist's. Ah, visiting Tyke's Court is man's work. No, not even man's work. Tyke's Court ought to be visited and consoled by machinery. Oh, the men and the women. I don't know which were which, but Mr. Clark assures me I saw both. Didn't you discover any children? Mr. Clark said I did. There were some objects smaller than others. Those, I understand, were the children. When you first came to us, Miss Moxon, you were going to fondle all the little ones in our parish. Oh, so I would. So I would tomorrow, now... If somebody would only wash them. Noel Bryce, writing again. Ah, uh, we shall get them washed in time. In time? To herself. And I'm going home in a few days. 
there's a letter for you, Miss Moxon, on the mantelpiece. Mrs. German, rising and taking the letter. Oh, thank you. Bertha, quietly to her. Did Mr. Clark happen to say he was coming downstairs this evening to see Uncle Noel? Yes, he's coming. Kissing her. To see Uncle Noel. Bertha runs into the further room and goes out. Mrs. German opens her letter to herself. From Constance. Her letters make me tremble. Reading. Dear Di, I grow more horribly nervous about our escapade every day. I get absolutely no consolation from Mr. Pinching. Of course, after his discovery of Miss Slendon, I was forced to admit that you had gone away on a philanthropic mission. But I refuse to disclose your whereabouts, and his kisses are but on the brow. Poor Constance, for my sake. The servants gossiped so at your sudden disappearance that I thought it best to tip them lavishly all round. Therefore, Mrs. Clegg, the housekeeper, has your new Indian shawl. No news of Mr. Jermyn beyond the Paris letter which I sent you, but Mr. Pinching went to London yesterday, and I can't get rid of the impression that he has an appointment with your husband in town. Oh, how near! Perhaps this very day, too. Now, if Mr. Jermyn should return here prematurely, what am I to say? I think I shall feign madness and babble incoherently. Dear Diana, do come home. The blot which follows is a tear. Your engagement, I mean my engagement, I mean our engagement with Mr. Bryce, was merely as companion to his niece during a holiday. When do you expect him back? Looking at Noel. When do I expect him back? He won't start, poor fellow. Get him home by all means. No man, no curate at any rate, ever needs more than ten days' rest, and you have been absent that time from your distracted Constance Moxon. P.S. I pulled a grey hair from my head this morning. N.B. About a dozen awful men have taken up their abode at Shodley Heath Farm. We close all our shutters now. Putting the letter in her pocket. Oh, yes. I must extricate myself from this predicament tomorrow. The next day at latest. What should keep me at St. Jacob's when I have failed so miserably in the work I thought my true mission? Bertha returns to the inner room and busies herself with the tea things. But why hasn't Mr. Bryce gone for his holiday? I can't make that out at all. Noel is thinking, pen in hand. She approaches the writing table. Mr. Bryce? Miss Moxon? Mr. Bryce, have you forgotten why you engaged me? Uh, why you engaged a companion for your niece? No, uh, let me see. I wanted a lady to do some of the easy visiting and to keep Bertha company while I... While you were absent from London on your holiday. Oh, yes. I was going away, wasn't I? You were. And aren't you? Not now. I've changed my mind. Changed your mind? The fact is... The rector and I don't agree very well. Or, rather, Mrs. Porcher, his wife, doesn't like me. And Mrs. Porcher is the rector, and both the church wardens of St. Jacob's. She was very angry at the idea of my wanting rest. And besides... Besides, when you came, I felt as if I no longer needed a holiday. I'm afraid, Mr. Bryce, I want to ask you now to let me, to let me go. Let you go? Let you leave us, Miss Moxon? Tomorrow. So soon? Or next day. Your niece no longer needs a companion, and I have failed wretchedly in my visiting, and, and I have other reasons. I am very sorry. Thank you. Dear Bertha will miss me. Miss you? Ah, so much. And it is concerning Bertha that I want to leave a little warning behind me. Mr. Bryce, who and what is this Mr. Clark? 
You don't dislike him. Oh, I like him very much. So do I, and that's nearly all I know, that I like him. You see this sprained wrist? Well, that might have taken the form of a broken head or a broken back, but for Tom Clark. A hero? No, a typical English lad. I interfered one night in a drunken riot down below here, near the docks. Clark came to my aid, and we fought our way out of it back to back. He had just come ashore from a voyage. He's a sailor, you know. So I got him a lodging upstairs in this house. And we're friends. That's Tom Clark. Thank you, Mr. Bryce. Now don't you think you had better find out something more about the boy as soon as possible? Why? Why, in case he should fall in love with Bertha. Fall in love? Don't men fall in love, Mr. Bryce? Noel Bryce, looking at her earnestly. I beg your pardon. Yes, indeed. There is a knock at the door. Tom Clark, speaking outside. Will somebody open the door? There is the boy. Opening the door to admit Tom Clark, a bright young fellow of about twenty, with a breezy, impulsive manner, who carries a large cardboard box. What have you got there, Tom? I don't know. Dynamite, I think. The carrier left it at the door as I came down. To Mrs. German. I hope you're better. Very much, thank you. Oh, Miss Moxon was such fun at the chemist's. Bertha. Coming from the other room. A box. Addressed to the curate of St. Jacob's in the East. Some response to our appeal for the poor children, I expect. Oh! oh. Open it for them, Tom. He goes into the further room and takes up a newspaper. Tom worries at the string of the box while the two women look on eagerly. I wonder what is inside. Guess. I know, little white frocks. No, Bertha, surely not. Brown frocks with small holland aprons are more serviceable. It's very securely done up. If it's frocks, there must be at least twenty. It must be frocks. The appeal was so piteously worded. Make haste, Tom. It might be boots. Of course it is. It's boots. That's it. It's boots. Boots, 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 boots. Tom Clark, hot with his exertion. That's it. He takes the lid from the box and puts his hand inside. What is it, Tom? It isn't frocks. Nor boots. Here's a list on the top. Producing an open sheet of notepaper. A gold crest. Oh. oh. Portman Square. Mrs. Horace W. Piggott Blundell, in response to the affecting appeal in today's paper, has pleasure in forwarding to the curate of St. Jacob's in the East, for distribution among the deserving, thirty numbers of the illustrated London News. He throws the letter into the box and bangs the lid on it in disgust, saying to himself, And I paid one and eightpence for the carriage. He carries the box into the further room, Followed by Bertha. Mrs. German, sitting at the writing table. Mr. Price's sermon. Reading. What is philanthropy? Ah, oh, what is it? Is it that bundle of picture papers? Or Spencer's wretched freak at Shodley? Or my foolish deceit in taking Constance's place here? Shall I ever find out? Tom comes to Mrs. German. Miss Moxon, are you inclined to help a fellow? What fellow, Mr. Clark? Look here, I like you, Miss Moxon. I think you're a brick, and I know you have a jolly lot of influence with Noel, uh, Mr. Bryce. I? Yes, rather. And I want you to use it for me like a dear good soul. Will you? How? In this way. Bertha comes from the further room, carrying a cup of tea in each hand but stops short when she hears her name mentioned. I'm in love with Bertha. I love her fearfully. Nobody suspects it because I'm so careful. 
but she's going shopping after tea, and I'm to escort her. And I know she'll take my arm. She won't if you don't ask her. But I feel I shall ask her. I say to myself, I love Bertha all day long. I go to sleep with the words on my tongue. I wake up with them there. They are there now. And when I talk to her as we trudge along the streets together, I shall be obliged to open my mouth and out they'll roll, won't they? Bertha returns solemnly on tiptoe to the further room, carrying the cups. I won't interrupt them just now. It seems to me that you don't want much assistance, Mr. Clark. But I shall, to get Noel's consent to our marriage, because I want to be married at once. Oh, would next week do? Yes, next week would do very well, thank you. As far as I'm concerned, I could wait a week longer, but I'm not selfish altogether, Miss Moxon, and I'm burning to help old Noel. But I don't see how... Why, Noel is awfully poor, driven like a slave, worked to death. Ah, oh, you don't guess what a fine chap he is. They both turn to look into the further room. Bertha is talking to Noel, who is stroking her hair fondly. Poor fellow. Poor fellow. You know, when his brother died, Noel took all the children. Bertha's grown up, but there are three very small ones with a nurse, and he gets a hundred and twenty a year from old Porcher. Oh. Too much, isn't it? Well, then, when I marry my Bertha, I shall get him out of the grinding grip of old Mrs. Porcher and whip him off into the country, where he'll pick up his strength in a jiffy. See? Oh, are you very well off, then? Haven't a brass button, you know. Really, Mr. Clark? But my dear old father is rich. He and I quarrel awfully. Well, then, how... Why, the moment I marry, I write and break it gently to the dad. Dear dad, I'm married. Yours, etc. See? Perfectly. That couldn't be a shock to him, could it? No. Well then, what's the result? Dad burning with anxiety to see my wife? My wife? Doesn't it sound jolly? It sounds pretty well. I take her home. I can picture Father standing, glum and sulky at the gate. Who's this? I can hear him saying it. My wife, Dad. Your wife? What, that pretty little fairy? I like your taste, my boy. Come in, we dine at seven. See? You seem to have thought out everything very carefully. Yes. If every fellow were as cautious, there wouldn't be so many injudicious marriages. Noel Bryce, at the folding doors. Tom, why don't you let Miss Moxon have some tea? What are you discussing? Bertha, pulling Noel back. Oh, Uncle, don't disturb them. Just coming, Noel. To Mrs. German. Be quick. I see you'll help a fellow, won't you, eh? Won't you? Mrs. German, to herself. Would this be philanthropy? I wonder. But, my dear Mr. Clark, if you are so certain of Bertha's influence, why not gain your father's consent before your marriage? <laughs> you don't know my dad. When Bertha and I are married, we'll ask you down. He's great fun. Besides, I've got a horrid stepmother. I know the kind of woman. Thin, pale lady with spectacles, black hair falling down like window curtains over her forehead. <sighs> Awful. The tea is quite cold. Bertha, taking him away. Oh, no, it isn't. Not quite. I'm coming. Tom Clark seizing her hand as she is going into the further room. Oh, Miss Moxon, how do you get me married quickly? Miss Moxon. Well, well, I'll think of what I can do. Bless you for that, because you can do everything. Ah, you're as good and as beautiful in your way as Bertha is in hers, and whenever a man falls in love with you, Miss Moxon, I hope he'll worship you as I worship my dear girl. Oh, no, please don't say that. Mrs. German goes into the further room to the tea table as Bertha, with a hat on, joins Tom. I'm ready, Mr. Clark. It seems selfish of me to drag you out. Not at all. Are we going far? No, only just round the corner to a hat shop. Oh, don't you know any distant hat shop? 
Yes, but I always steal at this particular one. Noel comes from the other room reading a newspaper. Bertha at the door. Goodbye, Uncle Noel. I shan't be long. Goodbye, dear. Oh, Bertha, don't... Don't say you won't be long. Mr. Clark? If you only knew. If you only guessed. Guessed what? How much I... How much I... Want you to give the other hatchops a chance. Tom and Bertha go from the room. Noel Bryce to himself. Now, half a sermon from two leaves one and a half. One sermon and a half between this and Sunday, my article to finish for the seraphim, a mother's tea on Friday night, two dockyard carpenters, both very bad characters, to marry tomorrow morning. Sitting at the table. Come, Rice, my good fellow, you must put on the steam. Mrs. German approaches him, carrying a cup of tea. Am I not too right for you this evening, Mr. Bryce? Thank you, Miss Moxon. My wrist is good for another hour. He writes busily. She stands watching him. Mrs. German, to herself, watching Noel. Poor fellow. Poor, generous, warm-hearted fellow. Tired out, domineered over by Mrs. Porcher, a hundred and twenty a year eked out by a few articles for the seraphim and four orphan children to feed and nurture. Poor fellow. Noel Bryce, reading from sheet of his sermon. It is true philanthropy to treat all mankind alike, not to turn your back upon any object because it does not belong to the particular class you have made it your habit or your boast to serve. He resumes writing. Mrs. German to herself. Surely that applies to me. Oh, if I could only render this man some service. Wouldn't that be real charity? I've never done anything half as good as that would be. Noel Bryce, dropping his pen and putting his hand to his wrist. Oh, hello, another twinge. Now perhaps you will resign that chair, Mr. Bryce. Thank you. I fear I must. He puts her in his place, then picks up the newspaper and glances at the advertisements. Mrs. German to herself. What could I do for him? What could I do? I can't think. Shall we begin work, Mr. Bryce? Noel Bryce, without looking up from the newspaper. Please. Good gracious. I've never read anything so monstrous. Look here. Shodley Heath, home for decayed jockeys. Oh. Opportunity for a young churchman in sympathy with our national sports and pastimes. Upon my word. Perhaps it means cricket? Cricket. Resuming. The founder desires the cooperation, as warden, of an open-minded, unprejudiced evangelist who detects an elevating tendency in horse racing and who is prepared to maintain that the English race meeting is both harmless and exhilarating. Why, the founder ought to be kicked. No, he oughtn't. Why? Why, look here. Three hundred pounds a year. Three hundred pounds a year? Write to Ralph Pinching, Solicitor, High Street, Newmarket. There's a temptation, a gross temptation, to throw before poor men, some like myself with hungry babies to feed. Three hundred pounds a year. The country, the crisp, bracing air, health, strength. Delightful. That's it. That's it. Three hundred pounds a year. No more anxiety. Bertha with rosy cheeks and little Teddy and Blanche and the baby. Rolling upon the grass at Shodley, 
filling the diamond casements of the farmhouse with their fresh ruddy faces or making its old rooms ring with the rattle of their metal spoons oh mr bryce why miss moxon you make quite a pretty picture of it i oh yes i can imagine little children at a place like what's its name imagine yes throwing the paper from him ah but it is wrong even to imagine it then you won't try to get there i my dear miss moxon the air here may be thick murky unwholesome but even for fresh air and three hundred pounds a year one doesn't sell one's convictions to this infatuated worshipper of the race course he begins loading his pipe mrs german to herself poor fellow to see him turning his back upon money and comfort for the sake of his conscience oh this pitiful noel bryce lighting his pipe i suppose the founder as he calls himself is a little mad i really don't see any evidence of it mr bryce picking up the paper and smoothing it out and i must say that i am surprised surprised at your bigoted prejudice against horse racing prejudice miss moxon surely anything tending to develop the wonderful capacities of a noble and intelligent animal like the horse oh yes i admit that's very interesting certainly and useful and therefore racing is and ought to be the characteristic sport of all englishmen including the clergy what is called sport miss moxon is too often mere brutality brutality was adam brutal adam what adam the adam were there no horses in eden we're taught to believe so then there mr bryce you have the origin of ascot the presence of eve uh, no no she wasn't there <laughs> you positively overwhelm me with the weight of your theology ah then won't you write to the solicitor at newmarket for the sake of the babies the babies my dear miss moxon the babies would grow up bandy and crooked if i professed opinions i do not hold mrs german to herself how is it possible to do good to such an obstinate man mr bryce mr bryce you're not going to crush me with adam again are you no but won't you dictate to me some sort of response to send to this solicitor to please me who am so fond of bertha of course i will if you'll allow me to write quite candidly ah thank you sitting at the table and addressing an envelope as she speaks to herself if he would write a half and half sort of letter it might do and then if he were appointed warden of shodley and came to find out who miss moxon really was he would forgive me all my deception and perhaps learn to remember me as an angel in disguise an angel in disguise i have begun by disguising my hand mr pinching would never recognize that to noel i've addressed the envelope very neatly mr bryce will you begin now hmm dictating his back turned toward her sir dear sir dear sir sir mrs german writing oh i have absolutely no sympathy with any sport or pastime which has gambling and other evil passions for its accompaniment mrs german to herself without writing oh that won't do nor do i perceive any feature in horse racing tending to the elevation or ennoblement of the mind of man oh dear oh dear what an obstinate man of the mind of man have you got that 
Yes, Mr. Bryce. But if you want a guardian for your people, who will strive honestly to instruct, to guide, and to comfort them, I will accept your wardenship. Your obedient servant. Blank. How does that read? Capital. The very thing. How is it possible to be philanthropic with a man like this? I can see his babies all getting weak and bony and... Why should I not indict my own sort of letter? A careful half-and-half -half sort of letter and get Bertha to coax him into signing it in the morning. I'll try it. It's a forlorn hope. Looking towards Noel, who has put his head back and is dozing as she begins writing. My dear sir, I have read your advertisement in the Seraphim. That's true. I must be strictly truthful. Writing? And I shall be delighted. Looking cautiously towards Noel, who makes no sign. Delighted to accept the wardenship of your much-needed home. Looking up, frightened. That's rather truthful. Writing? Your much-needed home for... for... Disabled horsemen. The poor fellow will like that better than decayed jockeys. Writing? It would be my endeavour to reconcile my views to yours. That's just the same thing as reconciling Spencer's views to his, of course. And to discharge my duties according to the dictates of my conscience. Why, it's his own letter. Put a little more pleasantly. Writing. Believe me, my dear sir, very sincerely yours. Space for signature. Oh, I wonder if he'll ever see it in the proper light. Oh. Noel Bryce, rising himself. I beg your pardon. I was half asleep. Mrs. German, holding the letter behind her. Were you? Well, am I to sign the letter? The letter? Uh, about the wardenship. Oh, that letter. Producing it awkwardly. If you're alluding to that letter, I... I have that letter here. Noel Bryce. Taking the letter from her and sitting at the table, he selects a pen. Thank you. Half to himself... I'll just glance through it. Oh, Mr. Price! Taking the letter from him and laying it before him while she conceals the written part with her hand. That's where you sign? There, at the bottom of the page? Yes, but I was going to read it first. No, no, afterwards. Then you'll see how it looks all together with the signature. I thought perhaps it was rather too abrupt. No, it doesn't seem so very abrupt. He tries to sign his name, but she nervously moves her hands over the letter to prevent his seeing its contents. I beg your pardon. I can't write if you do that. I... I'm trying to help you. Noel Bryce, signing his name. That's it. Now I'll... Oh, no, let me. Let me read it. It's written in such an odd way. Are you ready? Quite. Er, uh, um, you're not paying attention, Mr. Bryce. Indeed I am. My dear... Eh? Sir. Oh. I... I... Tom and Bertha suddenly enter. Uncle Noel! Look out, old fellow. What's the matter? She's coming. She? Who? Mrs. Porcher. Hush, don't be frightened. Bring her in, Tom. Tom hurries out. Good gracious. What mischief is this old lady bent on now? Mrs. German, to herself. Oh, the letter. Folding and closing the letter. Ready for the post. Oh, 
Oh, I wonder if I have done quite right. Tom introduces Mrs. Porcher, a grim old woman in black and a formidable bonnet, who enters with a solemn glare. Come in, Mrs. Porcher. Mrs. Porcher, eyeing Mrs. German severely. Is this the Miss Markham I hear of, the lady now in residence here? This is Miss Moxon, the lady who was kind enough to be a companion to my niece. Mrs. German bows slightly. Mrs. Porcher coughs asthmatically. Sit down, Mrs. Porcher. Mrs. Porcher silently enthrones herself. A footstool. Bertha and Tom fetch footstool which Noel places at Mrs. Porcher's feet. This is not the complimentary hour for calling, nor is this, I regret to say, in any sense a complimentary visit. Bertha and Tom retire on tiptoe into the further room and close the folding doors softly. I hope, at least, Mrs. Porcher. Please, but for the performance of an unpleasant duty, any hour seems to me appropriate. Pray allow me to leave you. Er, uh, no. I think it would be better if Miss... Miss Moxon would pay me the compliment of remaining. I grieve... I grieve to say that Miss Moxon is unpleasantly associated with the object of my visit. In which case, I should prefer receiving a written communication from you, Mrs. Borcher. I think not. The cold formula of a letter is necessarily frigid and repellent, in dealing a blow, the sympathetic cadences of the human voice are much preferable. Mr. Bryce, Dr. Porcher, has, during the term of your curacy, permitted you to discharge many, if not all, his duties, in addition to your own. You cannot deny it. It is certainly the case. I thank you for the frankness of that admission. And why is this so? For eighteen years, Dr. Porcher has not slept uninterruptedly through one entire night. My cough commencing regularly at sundown has not permitted him to do so. That cough being now chronic, I can hope for no amelioration in the condition of Dr. Porcher. In the meantime, Mr. Bryce, he is dependent on the faith, the enthusiasm, the integrity of his curate. And that faith, that enthusiasm, and that integrity he has always had from me? Do you call it into question? Pardon me. Up to about ten days ago... I think that is the time when Miss Moxon was first received into your house. Up to that time, I, a man and wife being one, I speak as Dr. Porcher, I had but slight cause for complaint. Whether you speak for Dr. Porcher, or for yourself alone, or for both of you, I beg you to speak carefully. I am not, Mr. Bryce, at all in the habit of trusting to inspiration. I have here memoranda. Referring to her tablets. When six weeks ago you suggested taking a short holiday, you advertised for a temporary companion for your niece. For your niece! Well then, Mr. Bryce, in due course this lady arrives here and immediately relieves you of some of your duties of visiting, a thing which I, her senior, if I mistake not, would hardly have presumed to do. Well, madam, what then? Then, Mr. Bryce, one would conjecture that the time had arrived for you to leave London. My arrangements became altered. I had reasons. Quite so. I feared this. I have feared this tremblingly. You have feared what, madam? I beg your pardon? You have associated my name with the object of your visit here. I want to know what your fear is in connection with the abandonment of Mr. Bryce's holiday. Hmm, certainly. I fear that Dr. Porcher will never be able to quite satisfy those ladies of our parish who are so concerned about this business that Mr. Bryce did not relinquish his holiday because... Because? Noel Bryce to Mrs. German. Hush. To Mrs. Porcher. Please. Because? Because Mr. Bryce had found not only a companion for his niece, but a companion for... Noel Bryce to Mrs. Porcher, pointing to the door. Leave this room. What? Leave this room, my house. Leave it. When can I see Dr. Porcher? It must be soon, immediately. I speak with the voice of Dr. Porcher. Ah, 
Don't you understand what I mean? That I desire to wash my hands of you all without a moment's delay. Let me be rid of you. Your money has mildewed the bread with which I feed the dear ones who are dependent upon me long enough. Let me be rid of you. Mrs. Porcher, producing a letter. Anticipating some unseemly outburst of this nature, Mr. Bryce, I am armed with a letter from Dr. Parcher, written reluctantly at my dictation, informing you that Mr. Charlesworth, your dear amiable predecessor, is ready to take your place at once. Noel Bryce, taking the letter. Tomorrow. Go, please, go. He opens the folding doors and calls Tom. Mrs. Porcher to Mrs. German, who is standing as if stricken with her head drooping. Pardon me? The Christian name Constance, I think. Mrs. German looks at Mrs. Porcher without replying. Constance, I remember. I shall feel it my duty to report the name of Constance Moxon unfavourably to the Governess Institute. Tom opens the door. Mrs. Porcher sails out and he follows her. Oh, Miss Moxon? Hush. Don't speak to me, please, Mr. Bryce. Don't, don't speak to me. She puts her handkerchief to her eyes. Bertha runs to her side. What is the matter, dear? Uncle Noel, has Mrs. Porcher made Miss Moxon cry? Noel Bryce to Mrs. German. Only say that you can pardon me for never suspecting that this woman's, that any woman's, malice could go to such a monstrous length. Mrs. German softly to know. Hush, Bertha. Mrs. Porcher is very angry, Bertha, because your uncle has not taken his holiday. So terribly angry. Mr. Bryce, pray don't give another thought to my share in the matter. Never let it cross your mind again. Oh, how dare she! How dare she! But why are you crying so, dear? I... I am crying a little, Bertha, because I have to run away from you so very suddenly. I leave this house tonight. At once. No starts. Tonight? Not for good. Yes, for good. I am of no use, you know, because, because your uncle has not gone for his holiday. Oh, why don't you persuade her to stay, Uncle Noel? Hush, dear. Come with me. Miss Moxon. Mrs. German, turning to Noel. Don't, please, please. Oh, Mr. Bryce, why, why couldn't you have gone for your holiday? She goes out with Bertha. Oh, the insult to her! And under my roof! The insult to her! The insult to her whose smile does more to brighten this parish than all the sun that ever finds its way here. Crushing Porcher's letter in his hands. My formal dismissal from Dr. Porcher. He shall see me tomorrow. I need not curb my tongue to him in defense of the woman I love. Oh, at least I can speak the words to myself. The woman I love. Tom enters. What has the old lady done now, Noel? I'm out of St. Jacob's, Tom. Ah, oh, you know. Then so am I. Mind you, don't shake me off. I'm after you and Bertha, wherever you go. But I haven't told you the worst of it, my boy. Why? What's wrong? She has robbed me of... of a friend... A friend I can't spare. Her bitter tongue is driving Miss Moxon away from us tonight, and... and... Ah, Tom, you're a little more than a boy, and don't understand, and I can't tell you. Little more than a boy, am I? Can't understand, can't I? I know I'm in love, too. What do you mean by you're in love, too? I mean I love Bertha. Tom Clark! Why, what a fool I should be if I didn't. Oh, no, love gives a fellow a pair of spectacles which enables him to see right through another fellow's waistcoat and straight into his heart. <laughs> My old chap, I guessed it a week ago. I don't know what you mean. A week ago? Why, Tom, 
I didn't know it then. No, but the man himself is always the last to find it out. Oh, I'm so glad, old chap. Glad? You know I shouldn't have liked you to marry anybody I didn't quite approve of. But I do admire her. So does Bertha. I think we're both to be congratulated, eh? Be quiet. Don't go on in that way, Tom. I can't bear it. She's leaving me. I may never see her again. And even if these few past happy days could go on unbrokenly for years to come, I could never open my lips about love. Why, man, how could I? How could you? Oh, I'll tell you how. Will you be quiet, Tom? You know I haven't a penny in the world. Well, no more have I, and I proposed half an hour ago. Bertha enters, crying. Tom, will you g g go and find a c cab to take Miss Moxon away? Bertha, dear, let us look for it together. I think Nell has something awfully important to tell Miss Moxon. Hush. Looking at Noel. Dear old Noel, I think he's a lucky chap after all. Tom and Bertha go quietly out. The room is growing gradually darker. Mrs. German enters. Mrs. German, looking about her. Bertha! Bertha! She sees Noel. To herself. Where is Bertha? Poor fellow, I didn't want to say goodbye to him alone. Noel Bryce, facing her suddenly. You are going away, then? Really going away? Yes, I... I am waiting for a cab, Mr. Bryce. The thought that you are driven away from us in such an infamous manner is maddening to me. Oh, you mustn't let other people's ill nature hurt you so much. As for myself, I was going tomorrow. A few hours earlier, what can it matter? No, no, that's true. What can it matter? But I, um, Bertha and I... We're rather dull and lonely here when you found us, and somehow you, as a newcomer often will... Oh, yes. A strange face does break the monotony of life, doesn't it? Yes. And when one loses that face, when it has ceased to be a strange one, when one enters a room thinking to see a familiar form in that corner or in that, and is almost startled to find nothing... Then... Then one is pained, naturally, for a day or two. Yes, I mean, for a day or two. He turns away from her and goes to the window. Is that a cab at our door? Yes. He goes to the door and opens it. Mrs. German, to herself. I'm glad the time has come. Noel Bryce, to himself. Some people asking for Tom. They've gone upstairs to his room. He closes the door. Goodbye then, Mr. Bryce. Noel Bryce, taking her hand. Goodbye. Miss Moxon, will you, as the parting act of a friend, solve a problem which arises in the life of every poor man, and which tonight crosses me in mine? You know how poor I am, how prospectless, saddled with cares, almost without worldly hope. But I have never despaired till tonight. And yet till tonight I have not been so near setting foot upon a path full of encouragement and light. I am at the crossroads of life. Read for me the index which points this way or that. Of course I will help you if I can, Mr. Bryce. What is your trouble? The room is now almost in darkness. There is a woman I love, whom I love as I love no other earthly being. Tell me, could I approach her with such a tale of poverty and struggle upon my lips as I have told you, my friend? What would she say to me if I presumed to ask her to be my wife? Surely if she loved you, she would trudge the hard road with you. But is it not womanlike to fear poverty? Yes, to fear and to face it. 
You bid me speak to her, then? If you trust her, yes. Then give me your hand again. Mr. Bryce? Noel Bryce, taking her hand. And let me speak to you. To me? To you, the woman I love with all my heart. Mrs. German, retreating from him slowly as if in a dream. The woman you love? Oh, what have I done? German appears at the door, but neither Noel nor Mrs. German hears or sees him. Speak to me, friend. Still, friend, the dearest name a man can give even the woman he would make his wife. Noel seizes her hand. German retreats and closes the door sharply. Hush! Oh, hush! Who's there? Who's there? German knocks, then reopens the door and enters. Mrs. German crouches behind the armchair. I really must apologise. I'm afraid you didn't hear me knock. Have you any business with me? My name is Bryce. My dear sir, I'm pleased to meet you. I'm told you're a great friend of my son. Your son? My son, Alan German, the boy who calls himself Tom Clark. Alan German? Tom Clark? With a stifled cry, Mrs. German, hiding her face, staggers into the further room and shuts the folding door. At the same moment, Pinching appears in the doorway. German, here's the boy, Alan. Alan enters with Bursa. Alan. Alan, grasping Pinching's hand boisterously. Ralph, good gracious me, well, I never... How did you find me out? Never mind. How's my father? Does he ever ask about me? Well, I am glad to see you. Here, no, no. Bursa lights the gas, pinching, pointing at German. Look there. Father. Alan, me boy. They are about to embrace effusively when they simultaneously draw back and look at each other. Hello, father. How are you? Hmm. Do you know you were very disrespectful to me when I last had the pleasure of seeing you, sir? I'm sorry you think so, father. I do more than think so, sir. I'm sure of it. German, German, Alan, my boy. Well, I don't know. However, taking Alan's hand, I'm pretty well, thank ye. Glad to see you, Dad. Backed any of the wrong ones lately? What do you mean by that? Don't you dare to mention King Carraway. Alan, German, no, no. I beg pardon, Father. No. To German. This is Mr. Bryce, the Reverend Noble Bryce, the dearest fellow in the world, my true friend. German shakes hands with Noel. Ah, Tom, Tom. I was Tom Clark's friend. But I'm quite a stranger to Alan German. I was going to spin you the whole yarn tonight, wasn't I, Bertha? Hey, Oh, Bertha, Mr. Bryce's niece, Bertha, the dearest fellow in the world. I mean, another friend of mine. German bows. Bertha, quietly to Alan. Oh, Alan, I'm so afraid. Afraid, my darling? In the hat shop you were all mine. Now I feel towards you as I do towards the books from the lending library. The chapters of your life are not for me alone, and when you leave me, other people may take you in and turn you up at the corners. No, never this book, Bertha. Oh, Alan, Alan, you'll always be Tom to me, won't you, dear? The folding doors slightly open and Mrs. German looks eagerly at the outer door for means of escape, but draws back quickly. Spencer German to Noel. A brave young fellow you think him, do you? You're right, sir. Mr. Bryce, let me call your friend of mine. Alan. Alan, turning from Bertha. Yes, father. You'll return with me to the hotel tonight. Oh, Tomorrow we'll pop down to Ascot to see the running of the gold cup. 
Next day I shall take you home. Did you know that your mother is dying with curiosity to see what her son is like? I should be happy to make her acquaintance, father. Good night, Mr. Bryce. Mrs. German again attempts to make her escape. Pinching, holding a note he has just scribbled. May I ask you, Mr. Bryce, to give this note to Inspector Mason when he calls tonight? It is to let him know the result of our search for Alan. I'll place it here. Laying it carelessly on the writing table and seeing the letter addressed to himself. Dear me, pardon me, I think this is addressed to me. Pinching of Newmarket. Mrs. Jermyn staggers back into the further room. I certainly have written a letter to a Mr. Pinching, solicitor of Newmarket. Pinching, pointing to the newspaper. In reference to an advertisement in the Seraphim, may I ask? Yes. Not applying for the wardenship of the home at Shodley Heath? Well, yes. Pinching, opening the letter. Will you allow me? I am the Mr. Pinching. Uh, certainly. Good gracious, Mr. Bryce. And I, sir, I am the founder. Why, no, what's all this about? German. German reads the letter with Pinching excitedly. Dear me, this is quite extraordinary. Excuse me. Taking the letter. My dear Pinchin, we have found the young liberal-minded sport and parson. Diana said there wasn't one in existence. No, here's a stroke of luck. Oh, Uncle Noel. Pinchin, the first, the only answer to our advertisement, the very man. To Noel, enthusiastically. Mr. Bryce, there is no time to lose in a scheme like this. When can you come down to Shodley? Directly, Dad. Oh, no, let Shodley. Bertha, five miles from Audlem House. Dad, you've got hold of the finest chap in the world. But, Mr. German, do you really mean that you can accept the propositions contained in that letter? Never read a letter that pleased me better in my life. Pension. Will you take Mr. Bryce down to the home by the 11.55 tomorrow morning? By all means, if he agrees. Mrs. German, with a horror-stricken face, comes from the folding doors and creeps gradually towards the door. Mr. Bryce, my son's friends are mine. Things happen strangely. Taking Noel's hand. Let me express a hope that you may long remain warden of Shodley. Come along, Alan. Alan, waving his hat. The warden of Shodley! Hurrah! Mrs. Jermyn, unperceived, staggers out at the door. End of Act Two of The Hobby Horse by Arthur Wing Pinero Act Three of The Hobby Horse by Arthur Wing Pinero. This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. The Third Act A Chapter of Expiation. The scene is an elegant morning room at Mr. German's, with French windows, a veranda, and a conservatory, and a view of the garden beyond. It is morning, and the breakfast things are on the table, placed at the entrance to the conservatory. Miss Moxon is sitting alone at the breakfast table. Here is Ralph. Going to window and waving her handkerchief. Oh, what a depressed object he looks. Pinching enters, looking very miserable, with a telegram in his hand. Oh, good morning, Constance. Good morning. How are you this morning? Beyond wishing I were dead, I'm extremely well, thank you. He kisses her upon the forehead abstractedly. On the brow. Where's Mrs. German? Pacing up and down the hall distractedly. There's her breakfast, untouched. I've had mine. We're stuck knee-deep in a nice, substantial quagmire, I must say. Showing the telegram. Mr. German and Alan have left London this morning by the early train, will be home in about twenty minutes. The prodigal's return. 
Miss Moxon gently falls against Pinching, holding onto his arm. Oh, Ralph, Ralph. Pinching, studying the telegram intently. Not just now, Constance, dear. Not just now, my love. I must, for I am so sorry for you. Sorry for me? Why on my account, particularly? Of course I am sorry, too, for poor Diana, and for Mr. German, and for that innocent clergyman at Shodley. Their troubles are to come. You are sorry for yourself also, Constance, I hope. You originated the whole mischief, if you remember. I know I did. But then, being engaged, the gentleman takes the entire responsibility. Leaning her head on his shoulder. And that must be so awful where the gentleman's a solicitor. You're right, Constance. It is awful. Shockingly awful. Oh, Constance, my dear girl, if less than a fortnight ago you had but confided to me the whereabouts of Mrs. German, I could have flown up to London, dragged her back by a few sensible words of advice, and saved everybody the catastrophe which is to break over our heads this morning like the culminating outburst of a grand pyrotechnic display. Oh, oh, oh. It was Diana's secret. Do you blame me for keeping it? Look at the result. I am the first woman who has ever kept a secret for a whole fortnight. You ought to worship me for it. I do, I do. But never do such a thing again, Constance. Besides, why blame me? Who was it who led Mr. German the night before last into the very house in which his wife was? You're a lawyer. Where was your instinct? A lawyer doesn't run along with his nose on the ground like a pointer. I don't know what a lawyer does, I'm sure. All my theories about lawyers are crumbling. My illusions used to be beautiful. I begin to be sorry I ever met a solicitor. Constance, my dear, solicitors are but men. Under the peculiar circumstances, it isn't for me to object to that. But you're bringing this Mr. Bryce down to Shodley yesterday and installing him within five miles of the very rug we're standing on. How could you? How could you? How could you? How was I to know that the poor man was madly in love with Diana German, alias Constance Moxon? Don't argue intemperately, please. There is about a quarter of an hour to decide. What is to be done? Oh, the case is clear enough. Hm. Hm. Now then. First, gently acquaint Mr. Bryce that he has formed an attachment to Tom Clark's, that is, Alan German's father's wife, who is Miss Moxton. No, no. First let Alan German know that his father's wife is his mother. Whose mother, my dear? Don't interrupt me. Tell Alan German that he is Constance Moxon's son. No, no, I don't like the idea of that. It doesn't put me in a nice position. The case is quite simple. First tell German that Mr. Bryce is in love with Mrs. German. That's easy enough. Oh, yes, that's all right. And who's going to transact that nice little easy bit of business? Who? It sounds like the solicitor's department. No, no, it is purely a woman's task. Diana's? My dear girl... Can we expect a wife to tell her husband that another man has proposed to her? Put yourself in that position. No, don't do that. I mean, the whole thing's in a nutshell. You've known Mrs. German since childhood. I do it? Oh, Ralph, what an unmanly proposal. Who is to do it, then? Would Mr. Bryce like to help? He's the nearest clergyman. Help to let German know that he loves... Oh, Constance... Very well, then. We are forced to return to the only disinterested person, the young family solicitor. Disinterested? When the original mischief arose from a suggestion of the lady I'm engaged to marry? Ralph Pinching. My dear. Ralph Pinching of Newmarket. That is about the fiftieth time you have upbraided me with my innocent complicity in this unfortunate business. I ask you one question. Do you wish to break it off? Of course I don't, my dear girl. Very well, then. I do. I literally sicken of this never-ending cruelty. Cruelty? Constance, darling. You can be gentle at times, but your gentleness is that of the summer sky, which anon sends forth its fiery shaft to ignite and to destroy, Mr. Pinching. My dear girl, you know you don't mean... I mean that I must be quite perfect in the eyes of the man I marry. The chains of our engagement have clanked for a fortnight, Ralph Pinching. Let mine be the hand to strike them from your chafing limbs. 
Good morning. She goes out through the window. We have the same scene regularly, every day, and in very nearly the same language. Studying the telegram again. But I can't think of my own bothers with so many of other people's to distract me. Now, what? Miss Moxon re-enters and comes to pinch him. Ralph, dear. Ah, my darling. I have carefully thought over our recent interview. Which one, Constance? The one we had just now. And I have come to the conclusion that we ought to be much more mutually tolerant. All these sad misunderstandings are the common incidents of long engagements. Pinching intent on the telegram. Yes, dear, yes, they are, they are. You will forget what I said to you, won't you? I do forget it, my darling, entirely. Forget and forgive? Oh, certainly. He kisses her forehead in an absent way. On the brow. Pinching, looking towards the conservatory. Mrs. German. Mrs. German enters through the conservatory. She is pale, her eyes are fixed upon the ground, her arms hang listlessly down. She holds a telegram. Die, dear. Constance. She puts her lips to Miss Moxon's forehead, then sinks upon the settee. On the brow. You look very white, Diana. I feel white. You didn't sleep again last night? Do I look as if I had slept? Two nights without rest. Hot hands. A galloping pulse. Oh, Diana, can't you... Can't you eat an egg? Oh, please. I've had an egg. And do I look as if I'd slept? Yes, Connie, dear, you do. Well, that's not my fault. Why don't you all say you blame me for what has happened? Oh, why was I born? Mrs. German, her eyes fixed upon the telegram. Oh, don't go back to years ago, Connie. Diana. I mean, the present is so terribly exigent. Before Mr. Pinching, too. Mr. Pinching? He's here. To Pinching, whom she brings forward. Poor Di wonders a little. She imagines that some things happened long ago. Mrs. German, shaking hands feebly with Pinching. Good morning. I see you have received a telegram. Yes, from my husband. Reading. Burlington, Cork Street. The boy most anxious to be presented to his mother. Thinks you're a dowager. Haven't undeceived him. Peppercorn picked up the gold cup. Expect us without fail by evening train. Pinching, looking at Mrs. German's telegram. Excuse me, thank you. To Miss Moxon. There's a discrepancy between our telegrams. They've written evening train in Mrs. German's and early train in mine. Then she doesn't know they may be here in ten minutes. No, you'd better tell her. No, you'd better tell her. Yes, but I thought, as you're a woman... I know, but you being a solicitor... Yes, I know, but... They argue. Mr. Pinching. Mrs. German. I believe you have been made acquainted with all the details of this dreadful business. Constance has told me everything. At my request. You... you are a solicitor. That's what I say. At an hour like this, one naturally gets a crumb of comfort from a clear brain and calm judgment of a man like yourself. You're very good. I... anything I can do? Thank you. I think you had better tell me all about this clergyman, Mr. Bryce. I understand you brought him from London to Shodley yesterday morning? With his niece, yes. Did he make any reference to... to... You know whom I mean. To me. He did. When I called for him in the morning, I found him in great distress of mind. At first he declined to accompany me. I asked him why. He replied that he had sustained a great loss. A most precious friend had gone from him. I asked in what way. He said as if the earth had swallowed her. A lady then, I said. Yes, he replied. The brightest, the sweetest, the dearest lady in the world. Thank you, Mr. Pinching. I would rather hear no more. Miss Moxon, to Pinching, shaking her head. Be quiet, be quiet. 
Mrs. Jermyn, to pinching, commanding herself. But he did travel with you to Shodley, after all. At my persuasion. Oh, yes. And you left Mr. Bryce and his niece at the farm. I did. Thank you, Mr. Pinching. I have thought everything over carefully and, I hope, conscientiously. The first thing to be done before my husband and his son return tonight... Pinching and Miss Moxon exchange looks. Tonight? Is to let Mr. Bryce hear the whole truth. Will you start for Shodley Heath at once, Mr. Pinching? Pinching bows. Tell Mr. Bryce the history of the foolish mistake. Tell him that I entreat his pardon for causing him so much, so much inconvenience, and beg him to understand that I cannot do this in person. At once, please. At once. Hewitt enters. <laughs> I beg your pardon, ma'am. What is it? You forgot to order the carriage, ma'am, to meet the master and Mr. Allen. Why, Hewitt, they don't leave London till the evening train. Lord bless me, I've just seen him drive up to the lodge in an iron fly. Mrs. Jermyn, clinging to Miss Moxon. Oh! Hewitt runs out at the window. I was afraid of this. My telegram said the early train. And you never told me? Oh, what a solicitor. I thought of mentioning it. Thought? This business quite upsets me. It's all through being engaged to one of the ladies concerned. Oh! Perhaps you wish to break it off, Mr. Pinching. Spencer German, speaking outside. Come through here, Ellen! Hewitt! <gasps> Mrs. German drags Miss Moxon out at the window as German enters with Alan. Ah, uh, Pinchin, here you are. Both friendly and business-like of you to be here to receive me. Looking at Pinching. What's wrong? Aren't you well? You do look seedy, Ralph. Tell me. You got Mr. Bryce down to Shodley yesterday? Oh, yes, he's there. That's capital. Capital. So the home's fairly started, eh? I'm proud of what we've done, Pinchin. Proud, sir. It's the culminating point in my turf career. Hewitt is passing toward the conservatory carrying bags and umbrellas. Where's your mistress, Hewitt? I don't know, sir. The ladies were here a minute ago. The ladies? What ladies? The mistress and Miss Moxon, sir. Goes through the conservatory. Miss Moxon? Spencer German, to pinching. Miss Moxon is staying with us again, then? Yes, she's here. She must have just returned from town. Yes, uh, just returned. I was quite astonished when Alan casually mentioned yesterday that a Miss Moxon had been acting as companion to Mr. Bryce's niece. You couldn't have known it either. No, I didn't know it. We little thought the night before last that we're in the very house with the lady you have the happiness to... Excuse me, Pinchin. Don't think me rude. One moment. Pinchin sits at the table. To Alan. Alan, me boy, it just strikes me. It's a very awkward thing, this attachment you've told me about of your friend, Mr. Bryce, to Miss Moxon. You know she's engaged to be married to Pinching. It is jolly awkward, father. I don't like it. She's an old friend of your mother's, but I can't have a woman down here playing fast and loose with two good fellows. Miss Moxon is a very nice woman. Ah, they're all nice till they're found out, my boy. I shall talk to Diana about it. Poor Pinchin. I knew his father. Poor devil. Be careful not to alarm him yet a while. Pinching is about to go out at the window. Wait for me here, Pinchin, please. Certainly. Alan, seeing the breakfast table. By Jove, here's some food. I'm starving. All right. I'll go upstairs and find your mother. Alan, my boy, I've kept it from you as long as I can, but... But... Your mother isn't an old lady after all, sir. She isn't, father. 
no sir nor a middle-aged lady she is a young lady much too young to own a great hulking boy like you you young scamp you <laughs> you think i can't play a good joke eh? ha <laughs> ha looking at pinching poor pinchin i knew his father too he goes through the conservatory alan seats himself at the breakfast table alan cutting a loaf this comes of dad dragging me away from the breakfast table this morning mrs jermyn and miss moxon appear outside the window and miss moxon enters on tiptoe while mrs jermyn shrinks back out of sight miss moxon clinging to pinching ralph ralph something must be done pinching in a fluster i know i know i was just thinking of doing something look at him eating happily she coughs alan rises with his mouth full mr german's son <clears throat> i beg your pardon to himself by jove she is a pretty woman to her i think i can guess who it is oh no you can't father has gone and spoiled his own joke i hope you don't think me too big to let me call you for once at least my mother he draws Miss Moxon to him and kisses her. No, no! Miss Moxon drawing back. Oh, dear! To herself. On the lips. You know that's a grown-up man, Constance. I don't care about it. That's right, blame me. Mr. German, we are all liable to error. Error? What error? Miss Moxon, pointing to pinching. This gentleman should have spoken earlier. My name is Constance Moxon. Your name, Constance Moxon? Indeed, yes. Diana, Diana, dear. Running to the window and bringing Mrs. German. This is Mrs. German. This is your new mother. Mrs. German stands before Alan with her head bowed. Alan, to Mrs. German. Mother. Oh, Miss Moxon looking from one to the other. Why? No, that lady is right, Alan. She is Miss Moxon, not I. I am Mrs. German. Miss Moxon, to pinching. No solicitor could have managed that better. You, Mrs. German? Yes, yes. I am afraid there is some mistake. No, no knows you are Miss Moxon. No. He only thinks he knows I'm Miss Moxon. But father knows you are Mr. Bryce's. I told him so. You couldn't have done so. You didn't know I was at Mr. Bryce's. Oh, don't say that. We were there together. But you never guessed I was your mother. No. Then how could you have told your father? I mean, I told him Miss Moxon was there. Well, there is Miss Moxon. Then it seems I've told a lie to father. Yes, you appear to have made a very bad beginning. Alan, to Mrs. German. Good gracious. Well, but father knows it knows in love with you. To Miss Moxon. N no, it's with you. No, it isn't. Who told him that? I mentioned it. How dare you? Haven't you any business to mind of your own? I'm very sorry. Sorry? Father asked me to tell him all about it. That's impossible. He did, because he accidentally strayed into the room while Nur was proposing to you. To Miss Moxon. No, I mean to you. No, you don't. Great heaven, what will he think of me? What does he think of me? But it was in the dark. Oh. In the dark? That makes it worse. Oh, Diana, you never told me you didn't have the lamp lighted. I see how awkward it is. Because one of you is engaged to Mr. Pinching. I am engaged to Mr. Pinching. Certainly. Of course. Then it isn't nice for Pinching, is it? Yes, it is. Yes, it's all right for Pinching. No, it isn't, because... No. And by Jove, it's father it isn't nice for. Mrs. German throws herself onto the settee. Alan, Alan, come to me. 
Oh, don't cry, Miss Moxon. Uh, I mean, Mother. I thought our first meeting, whenever it happened, would be so different from this. So it was, you know. I have often pictured my husband's son as the bright, impulsive young fellow you are. Have you never thought of what I might be? Well, yes, if you remember. I imagined you a thin, pale lady with spectacles. Oh, yes, of course. That was unkind of you, Tom. I mean, Alan. But didn't your father describe me to you, dear? Yes, he told me yesterday you were an enormously stout old lady. Oh! It was his little joke, you know. Then he hasn't told you of my fierce philanthropic cravings. My wild fancies for adopting and rearing little boys. No. Oh, I see. Yes, you see, Alan, what led me into this mad scheme of taking Constance Moxon's name and filling her place at poor Mr. Bryce's unknown to everyone. You don't blame your poor mother, do you? No, mother dear, of course I don't. I understand now all about it. Visiting Tyke's Court, eh? Mrs. German, crying. <laughs> yes. <laughs> that was rather a failure, wasn't it? Mrs. German, laughing and crying. Awful. <laughs> don't remind me of it. You're turning faint and coming to in the chemist's. <laughs> <laughs> Why, I should never have been so foolish if I had always had you to manage and control. My own dear little boy. No, mother dear. Mrs. German, smoothing his hair and arranging his cravat. I shall dress you quite differently from this in a day or two. Yes, mother. Yes, and I think I shall part your hair in that way. Thank you, mother. And you'll always look up to me and come to me for advice in your little troubles, won't you? Certainly. And I should like to say, Mother dear, that I am very sorry. Very sorry that I... You are going to confess a fault, my boy? Well, yes, Mother. I suppose I am. Sit there. What is it, child? Alan sits at her feet. She places her hand on his head. I was going to say that I... Yes. Don't be afraid that I shall punish you, Alan. You are very sorry that you... That I advised old Nell to... to propose to you, mother dear. You advised him? Yes, mother. He wouldn't have done it but for me. I egged him on. You did? Seizing him by the shoulders. You are the cause of all the mischief, then. Yes, mother, but listen. Mrs. German, rising and facing him. Oh, oh, why aren't you the same size as other mother's boys? Then I might properly chastise you. German bustles in at the window. Oh, my dear Diana, I've been running after you everywhere. How very inconsiderate. Kissing her. How are you, my darling? Oh, I'm not very well, Spencer, thank you. You look wide. Seeing Alan. Hello, you found my boy then? Yes, we've been talking. My dear, you're surely not concerned at his size. It doesn't make you any older, Diana. No, it isn't that, Spencer. Have you been upsetting your mother, sir, before you've been in the house ten minutes? No, father. Don't answer me, sir. Don't answer me. Go away. Alan joins Miss Moxon and pinching. He's a fine chap, isn't he? Very. Of course, you can't judge of his excellent qualities from seeing him once, can you? Oh, no. Wait till you've known him a week, Diana. Wait till you've known him a week. Oh. What is the matter, my dear girl? Miss Moxon, coming to Mrs. German's aid. How do you do, Mr. German? Ah, oh, Miss Moxon. Glad to get back to us, eh? Extraordinary coincidence. You're living in the same house with my boy and never suspecting it. You're quite old friends, you and... What did he call himself? Tom Jones. No, no, he didn't. He didn't. 
John Clark. Tom Clark. To himself. I've turned against that woman. Pinching joins German and Miss Moxon. Little did we suspect Pinching the other night how near we were to the lady we both, you especially, of course, know so well. Yes, but <laughs> how jolly to be together here again. Ha ha ha. To himself. Wants to change the subject. That woman is deceiving poor Pinchin. The singular part of it is, Miss Moxon, that when I stumbled into Mr. Bryce's room in the dark, I saw the figure of a lady. Miss Moxon, looking at Mrs. German. Ah. Spencer German, to himself. I thought so. To Miss Moxon. That must have been yourself, of course. Mrs. German, approaching. Oh, Spencer. One moment. To himself. I'll apply the test. To Miss Moxon. While I think of it, I've a plan for this afternoon. Diana, we will drive Pinching and Miss Moxon over to Shodley to drink tea with the warden of the home, Mr. Bryce. Mrs. German sinks upon the settee, and Miss Moxon sits aghast on the ottoman. Spencer German, looking only at Miss Moxon, to himself. I'm right, coquette. She shan't deceive poor Pinchin any longer. I'll consult Diana. Miss Moxon, Pinching and Alan talk together. German sits beside Mrs. German. Diana? Spencer? There's something I think I ought to tell you, my dear. There's something I want to tell you, Spencer. One moment, please, Diana. I did mention just now that when I entered Mr. Bryce's room accidentally the other night, I was unfortunate enough to witness a love episode of a very pronounced kind. Oh? I knew you'd be shocked. The fact is that this Mr. Bryce, who is a poor, earnest kind of man, seems to have been proposing marriage to Miss Moxon. Yes, but Spencer, she was not... she was not encouraging him. Well, dear, it was in the dark, of course, but I certainly didn't see any active protest on Miss Moxon's part. No, no, Spencer, you are wrong. I'll tell you all, everything, from beginning to end. The poor woman had no idea that Mr. Bryce thought about her seriously. Listen, Spencer, nettles. My darling, you know only your friend's version of the affair. But men are loyal as well as women. Permit me, therefore, to consider the feelings of my friend, poor Pinching. Hewitt enters and gives German a note, and they speak together at the window. Mrs. German beckons Alan to her. Alan, my boy, you will help me, won't you? Only help me. Of course I will. You were jolly kind to me at Knowles. Ah, that only shows that kindness is never thrown away. Alan, steal away quietly, go into the stable, put a saddle on my Betsy. She hasn't been out since I left home and will be frightfully fresh, and gallop over to Shodley Heath. Tell Mr. Bryce everything, Alan, and warn him. Warn him that we're all coming over to tea this afternoon. All right, mother. Trust to me. He runs out quietly through the conservatory. Spencer German, joining Mrs. German with a dirty scrap of paper in his hand. My dear, things are not going quite smoothly at Shodley Home, I'm afraid. Some of the poor fellows have walked over. A deputation, they call themselves to make some formal complaint about the behaviour of the warden. That's Mr. Price. Yes. I hope you haven't made any muddle in the affair, my dear Pinching. I? Spencer German. To Hewitt. I'll see these poor men here, Hewitt, at once. Hewitt goes out. Mrs. German to Miss Moxon. Oh, Constance, what has happened? Hush, dear, hush. Spencer German, reading the scrap of paper. Dear, oh dear, 
this is most unfortunate pinching i fear i very much fear that your precipitate engagement of this mr bryce is not going to result in complete success my dear german hewitt appears outside the window with shattuck muse malter a huge bullet-headed ruffian-looking person and lyman a wizen young man with a green shade over one eye come in men come in diana dear you will be interested i think come in the men enter and hewitt retires ladies all good morning good morning i'm sorry to read here that you're not comfortable and happy you men what do you want shattuck with an important cough <clears throat> i introduce this deputation very well do so first there's me mr pews you know and respect mr moulton never rode but kept the blue bull at doncaster so is one of us he lost his license unfairly through late hours though it was keeping up his sister's birthday on each occasion that he'll swear to mr lyman step out here bob the name of bob lyman is household word for wherever sport is honored he'll ride again bob will when honest men is stewards of the jockey club that's the deputation well 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 what is wrong with you what's wrong with us what is wrong with the reverend n bryce mrs german to herself oh nothing i hope nothing i should like his running inquired into that's all will you explain yourself you others speak up to lyman that little man there well ladies and gentlemen what mr shattock infers is the following we thought we was an entering ourselves for the free and easy stakes and we find ourselves running heavy in the church of england welter hear hear well put bob hear me dear ladies the reverend gentleman arrived yesterday afternoon having apparently sustained no damage on his journey down he comes up the path at shod leome with a neat little filly making all the running for him hush hush he's nice please i happened to be in the porch at the time of throwing up an armless coin or two with mr pews stop that he says stop what i says gambling he says good gracious very arbitrary eh pinchin i pockets the bitter insult and i marches straight into the drawing room where a few of our gentlemen was a playing parlor bowls and i says mark the game where it stands my lords here's the archbishop of canterbury dropped in you shouldn't have said that so the reverend and opinionated for forthwith he sticks hisself up again the mantelpiece and he preaches at us from half past three till tea time whereupon the young lady sings us a solemn air well we encored that not so much for the tune but to rile the reverend N. and then one of our gentlemen henry hawkins got melted and told his history that did us because henry's career hasn't been so honorable as what ours has and then the reverend N. lets us have it again races he says the only prize worth running for is the clear conscience cup distance three score years and ten sport he says duty your neighbor there's a sport for you and then him and the young lady shakes hands with us all round like hypocrites and retires to be weighed in having preached again us for three hours twenty by benson's chronometer being the longest sermon on record shattuck rejoins his companions who receive him approvingly well, well rude samuel well, well rude i must say i must say that this is not the treatment to which any follower of the turf should be subjected pinchin i am most indignant shattuck looking out of window hello look here here's a cowardly act what's that he can't trust us to tell our own tale he follows us from shodley there is a murmur of indignation from the men catching sight of noel mrs german and miss moxon make their escape who follows you from shodley him the reverend n here he is noel bryce enters with bertha good morning mr german hmm good morning bertha dear go and look at the flowers in the garden till i have finished 
Bertha goes out through the window. These men, Mr. German, knowing my intention to report the conduct of some of their number, are evidently here to defend themselves in advance. I am glad it is so. I beg your pardon? These men are here, Mr. Bryce, to prefer a complaint against... against... the warden, I regret to say. Indeed. Yes, Mr. Bryce, and may I ask you, sir, whether... Pinching is about to steal out. Pinching, please, kindly treat this affair with your usual professional strictness. Certainly, Chairman. May I ask, Mr. Bryce, whether you have thought it generous to reproach these unfortunate men with their calling, sir? Ye have. I certainly have made no effort to teach them to respect their calling. I don't like their calling, sir. What, Mr. Bryce? No, Ark, and before Bob Lyman, too. Benching, take notes of this, please. I was just thinking of doing something of that sort, German. But goodness gracious, Mr. Bryce, do you forget the wording of my manifesto in the Seraphim? No, I recollect it perfectly. Spencer German, losing his patience. Very well then, sir, is your behaviour to these unfortunate persons consistent with a thorough sympathy with our national sports and pastimes? No, indeed it is not. You admit it? Bless my soul and body, sir. Then do you mean to stand there and tell me to my face that you don't detect an elevating tendency in horse racing? I regret, sir that my observations have not informed me of such a tendency. Where's your letter? Where is your letter? In his endeavours to find the letter, he drops his cigar case upon the floor. Devil take the things. To Noel. I beg your pardon. Where's the letter? Here it is. Your letter, sir. My letter, sir? Spencer German, referring to the letter. May I ask you, Mr. Bryce, if this attitude is consistent with a delight, a delight, sir, in accepting the wardenship of my much-needed home? No, sir, it is not, for I cannot conscientiously affirm that the home at Shodley is a much-needed institution. Spencer German, beside himself, holding out the letter. Is that your letter? Certainly. That is my letter. Then I'm d- I beg your pardon. Pinching, pinching, you are my solicitor. I knew your father, too. It will be both a professional and a friendly act if you will endeavour to prevent my losing entire control over myself. Pinching, what can I say to this man? Good Lord, Pinching, what shall I do? Hmm. <laughs> Ask Mr. Bryce to read, word for word, his own letter to himself. Now I have done something. Spencer German, handing the letter to Noel. Your clear head is invaluable, Pinching. Noel Bryce, reading the letter. My dear sir. My dear sir. He reads the letter to himself. There, sir. There. There. Why, what? Oh, what is the meaning of this? I shall be glad to know, Mr. Bryce. This is no letter of mine. Surely you don't. Stop, sir. Yes, this is my signature. I have signed this. It is my letter. Now, Mr. Bryce, you will perhaps offer some explanation? I cannot. How... How can I explain this? That letter is evidently written at your dictation? Yes, but the matter of it is not inspired by any thought or word of mine. Do you mean, sir, that you've been made a fool of? That I have been made a fool of? Mr. German, I have accepted a post for which my opinions and sympathies quite unfit me. If you think I owe you an apology, I offer it freely. I make an appeal to you. I ask you to allow me to destroy this letter. 
and to turn my back upon Chardley Heath without delay. Mr. German, let me destroy this letter. Excuse me, sir, not just yet. My letter, please. Noel returns the letter. Whatever injury has been done you, Mr. Bryce, is more than doubled by the affront which the perpetrator of this joke has put upon me. I demand to know the name of the actual writer of this letter. I regret that I cannot give it. I, I cannot give it. You refuse to give it? I refuse. Take your men away for a moment, Mr. Shattuck. Wait outside, please. Examine his pedigree, dear gentleman. Go away. Look at his mouth, dear gentleman. Go away. The deputation then withdrew. Shattuck, Pews, Malta and Lyman go out. Mr. Bryce, will you be good enough to inform me if this letter is the handiwork of a lady? When I tell you that it was written by a lady whom I respect, don't you see that it should be destroyed? Destroyed. To pinching. Sir, if you have any influence over Mr. German, will you add your earnest request to mine that this letter should be torn to shreds and forgotten? Certainly, I do urge Mr. German most strongly to destroy the letter and let the matter drop. Pinching, you are probably less my solicitor than my friend. It is in the latter capacity that I fear I am going to give you considerable pain. German? Now, Mr. Bryce, will you forgive my asking you if the lady who wrote that letter is engaged to be married to you? Sir. You'd rather not answer? I will answer you. The lady is not engaged to be married to me. Spencer German, grasping Pinching's hand. I am delighted to hear it. My dear Pinching. Turning to Noel. My good sir, she has refused you? No, sir, she has not refused me. Not refused you? Poor Pinching. Sir, I am sorry to deduce from your statement that you are awaiting this lady's decision. I will tell you no more, Mr. German. Will you destroy that letter? Stop, Mr. Bryce, please. Pinching, my dear boy, in resenting the gross insult which has been put upon me, I find I must deal a severe blow, not to you alone, but to that gentleman also. Pinching, oblige me by asking Miss Moxon to join us. Miss Moxon? Did you say Miss Moxon? Pinching. Pardon me, German. As your friend, I would rather do nothing of the kind. Miss Moxon here, in your house? Certainly. Shall I ring for Miss Moxon pinching, or would you prefer my seeking her? No, no, wait one moment. He goes quickly into the conservatory. What is Miss Moxon doing here? What is she doing here? Miss Moxon is a friend of my wife's, and she has just returned to my house from yours. But this gentleman, Mr. Pinching, she is nothing to him? I regret to tell you, Mr. Bryce, that Mr. Pinching and Miss Moxon are affianced lovers. Ah. Miss Moxon enters quickly, followed by Pinching. Spencer German, with the letter in his hand. Madam, you will allow me to express my deep sorrow at the position I feel justified in adopting toward a friend of Mrs. German's. With your relations with these two gentlemen, I have perhaps little to do. Stop, sir. Hush, please. But with the writer of this letter, I have a distinct reckoning to make. Madam, your sense of humour may be more acute in your notions of jesting more practical than my own, 
but how greatly you may be my superior in these respects i call into question your taste in placing that gentleman in the position he now occupies and in ridiculing a scheme of charity which ignorance must have robbed you of the privilege of understanding handing noel the letter mr bryce i have done with that letter pardon me mr jermyn but may i ask this lady's name that lady's name because if it is not that gentleman's duty to defend her from the charges you have brought against her it is mine it is my duty i was just thinking of saying so do you mean to stand there and tell me that you don't recognize the lady who has resided in your house for nearly a fortnight chairman she has done nothing of the kind you'll drive me mad amongst you to noel you don't deny that the lady was recently your niece's companion certainly i deny it madam have you not just returned from mr bryce's lodgings oh no mr jermyn i have never seen mr bryce till this moment never seen him never seen him why the night before last i saw you see him jermyn believe me you don't know anything about it not know anything about it to know was miss constance moxon ever your niece's companion she was sir then how dare you all she was but mr jermyn you know that that lady is not miss constance moxon not miss constance moxon good heavens yes she is yes i am bertha appears at the window uncle uncle noel i found her i found her found her miss moxon she's here she's here miss moxon noel bryce turning to the others i told you so what trick are you all playing me miss moxon bertha enters dragging mrs jermyn by the hand uncle noel look here miss moxon miss moxon that is mrs jermyn that is my wife sir your wife miss moxon your wife why you don't mean that this is the lady who oh hewitt enters supporting alan who is limping all right sir young gentleman got thrown alan sinking onto the settee no mother pinching quietly to miss moxon i kept it from him as long as i possibly could nobody could have done more oh uncle alan is hurt alan he's all right miss young gentleman got betsy out of the stable on his own account he come off beautifully just by pinnock's gate never saw a gentleman come of neater hewitt retires mr bryce do i understand you to tell me that mrs jermyn is the lady you have hitherto supposed to be miss moxon mrs jermyn is the lady i have known as miss moxon he turns away and leans against the mantelpiece with his head bowed diana spencer then you and not miss moxon have been acting as companion to this young lady during my absence from odlam house yes spencer and i understand miss moxon that this has been with your connivance and assistance yes while at the same time you have remained my guest yes mr jermyn and you have known all this alan found it out this morning father and you pinching hm i learned the state of affairs yesterday spencer jermyn looking round from one to the other thank you you know father you've only been home about half an hour there hasn't been time to tell you all the news be silent alan quietly to bertha bertha my knee is awfully bad come and walk about in the garden they steal out through the window 
if my action has been at all undecided in this business, German. Mr. Pinching. I hope you will attribute it to my good fortune in being engaged to one of the ladies concerned. I am afraid I don't come out of it as well as I should like to, Mr. German. Excellently, Miss Moxon. I thought you had been guilty of a joke. I find it is nothing of the kind. Oh, take me away. I'm not used to unkindness and I can't bear it. Take me away. Pinching leads her out through the conservatory. Mr. Bryce, a few moments ago you asked me to destroy the letter which you now hold in your hand, and I refused to do so. I am now ashamed to discover that it is a letter written by my wife to which your signature has been obtained by unfair means. Is that so, Diana? It is so, Spencer. I am in your hands, Mr. Bryce. What do you intend to do with that letter? Return it to you, Mr. German. Thinking you may some day see in it nothing but the evidence of an impulsive lady's compassion and tender-heartedness towards a very poor man. He hands German the letter and walks away to the veranda. Spencer. Diana. That is the truth. I wanted to aid Mr. Bryce, who is so badly off. I wrote the letter, hoping to obtain his signature fairly, but when he had signed it in ignorance, it fell into Mr. Pinching's hand. Oh, you see what a plight philanthropy has brought me to. Unfortunately, everybody can see it. I know I'm a spectacle. It was worse than indiscreet of me to take Constance's place at Mr. Bryce's. I won't contradict you. Thank you. I did it on the despairing discovery that you couldn't, wouldn't sympathize with my aims. Oh? Yes. But even then, I didn't let anybody but you take me to London. Don't jest, madam. I won't, dear. Perhaps because I was in Mrs. Landon's bonnet and waterproof, you did not recognize me. Diana! Yes, Nettles, and you paid for my ticket to town, but only third class. And then, you must remember, when I did get to Mr. Bryce's, there was the boy, our son, to watch over his mother. And what has been my greatest fault? Why, procuring a warden for the much-needed home. Oh, don't look like that, Nettles. The home at Shodley Heath is a flourishing establishment. In your hour of triumph, pity my complete collapse. I thought that a ragged, uncombed, unwashed community was my sphere. Spencer, I have found out it isn't. <laughs> crying on his shoulder. Surely you can feel for a philanthropist less fortunate than yourself. Noel comes into the room. If I've done no good, I've done no harm. She sees Noel. Except, oh Spencer, you know the mistake that has occurred. Say what you like to me, but beg his pardon, for I can't. Mr. Bryce, Mrs. German tells me I am to beg your pardon. I do so. I have married a very foolish, headstrong lady. I beg your pardon. Mrs. German keeps your niece company and assists you in your parish work without my permission. I beg your pardon. In the meantime, you fall in love with my wife, sir, and you ultimately propose marriage to her in my presence. I beg your pardon. Oh, dear, oh, dear, you're not doing it properly. Mr. German, the tone you speak in spares me the pain of thinking that you believe an apology is necessary. As for my a mistake, it is slighter than you imagine. Slighter? Yes, sir. The only great mistake possible in proposing marriage is to select an unworthy object. I fell into no such error. I believed Miss Moxon to be a generous, warm-hearted lady whom any man should be proud to call his wife. I thought that, and I think it still. Spencer German, pointing to Mrs. German. 
But your Miss Moxon is Mrs. German, Mr. Bryce. So I find. And upon that I congratulate you with all my heart. Eh? Oh, thank you. Before I leave your house, Mr. German, I wish to discharge the duty which brought me here. Going to the window and calling. Shattuck! Shattuck appears at the window with Pews, Malta, and Lyman. Shattuck advances into the room. Don't listen to him, lady and gentleman. He's an outsider, lady and gentleman. I desire to tell you, Mr. German, that you are harboring at your house at Shodley a set of unprincipled ruffians to whom the man who befriends them is an object of contempt and ridicule. It was Hopkinson what said you had a tile off, sir. A tile off? Send Hopkinson away. Noel Bryce, taking a written paper from his pocket and giving it to German. I am going to hand over to Mr. German a letter written by you, Shattuck, which was intercepted by the man Hawkins and given to me last night. A letter? What letter? To German. Don't eat it, sir, don't eat it. It's a forgery, sir. There's a low lot in the ohm. German takes the paper from Noel and reads it. Diana! This is a letter from this man Shattock to a person named Emmanuel of Newmarket offering to dispose surreptitiously of eight brass candlesticks and all the cutlery and linen in the shoddly home. Oh, Spencer! I'm learning to write, sir. It's my exercise, sir. Let every man jack of you be out of shoddly farm by four o'clock today. Or I'll put this letter in the hands of the police. Pews, Lyman and Malta sneak away. Shattuck with scorn. The police? You wouldn't get smiled at, would you? Come, my man. I'll walk with you to the lodge gate. What, Mr. Spencer German? Did you think you was a-going to patronize men of the position of Bob Lyman in me? Let this be a solemn lesson to you. Why, you ought to be warned off every respectable race course, you foolish, vain old gentleman. Now, Mr. Shattuck, please. Here, am I to be paid for my time or not? If you don't leave this room, I'll ring for my servants. Ha! Here's ostentation. Shattuck goes out through the window and disappears, followed by Noel. The wretches! The ungrateful wretches! The sleepless hours this scheme has cost me. Nothing so complete had ever been organised. And then to think, only to think, that it shouldn't work after all. Oh, Spencer, your philanthropy, like mine, is an awful failure. Let our common misfortunes bring us together. Nettles. But look at my position. A little while ago, I had a home without a warden. And now I've a warden without a home. Write to Canon Carver and beg him to do something for Mr. Bryce. I will. Something a long way off. Alan and Bertha appear at the window. Father, those shoddy heathen men are picking all our flowers. Let them pluck them up by the roots. Mrs. German, pointing to Alan and Bertha. Spencer, look. I suppose you guess what that means. The scamp. Yes. Well then, why shouldn't we, both of us, rebuild the old farmhouse at Shodley and furnish it sumptuously as a home? Another home? A home for Alan and Bertha. Alan's home at Shodley, eh? That's something like my scheme. It is your scheme. And then, in time, when there are three or four babbling babies rolling upon the grass. Yes, but that's your scheme, Diana. It's something like my scheme. Don't you see, Nettles? We shall please each other at last. Pinching a Miss Moxon appear outside the window. Spencer, are you still thinking that you can't forgive me? No, Diana. I'm thinking that in the future I shall be seldom seen at Epsom and Ascot and Goodwood and Doncaster. 
Hush, Spencer. Why? Ah, because I mustn't leave my wife alone any more, Diana. No, Nettles, but... Taking his hand affectionately. You must always take her with you. End of Act 3 Introductory Note Six years ago, dramatic conventionality exercised an even greater tyranny than it does today, and British playgoers were less prepared than now to look favourably upon any effort to resist it. That the persons in a play should be dealt with according to the probabilities of actual life, when these clashed with the dictates of theatrical custom and poetical justice, was not to be endured. The expectations of an audience were held sacred, and were not to be tampered with. They were as inexorable as the laws of the Medes and Persians, and any dramatist who had the temerity to bring down his curtain without having first made all his sympathetic characters happy, might expect little favour. But even at that time Mr. Pinero was always inclined to fly in the face of the theatrically conventional in some way or another, and he actually dared to write a play in which the young clergyman, for whom the deep sympathy of the audience was enlisted, was permitted to fall innocently and honourably in love with a married woman whom he had thought to be single, and to suffer pain on her account, without the husband being conveniently killed off in the last act, to prepare the way for the clergyman's expected matrimonial happiness. And this play, Mr. Pinero, having his own dramatic purpose in view, described as a comedy. The Hobby Horse was produced at the St. James's Theatre under the management of Mr. Hare and Mr. Kendall on October the 23rd, 1886, and it was acted until February 26, 1887, 109 performances being given in all. Though it would be unjust to write this play down a failure, it was not exactly a success. That large section of the playgoing public which expects only to laugh at a comedy was puzzled between the comic and the sentimental aspects of the story, and therefore the attendance at the theatre gradually diminished. On the other hand, there were many who saw that this play was intended as a satire on those false philanthropic fads which are a sign of a sentimental age, who recognised in the abortive love affair of the young curate not an injustice done to their theatrical sympathies, not a capricious piece of cruelty on the part of the author, but the dramatic means by which the disastrous consequences of misdirected philanthropy were to be emphasised. That the play should have been called a comedy provoked the ire of some of the critics, who promptly repeated the charge of cynicism which has so often been hurled against Mr. Pinero for his efforts to be as true to life as the restricted conditions of dramatic composition destined for the stage will allow. And today, if you ask Mr. Pinero to define a comedy, he will playfully tell you it is a farce written by a deceased author. Perhaps the hobby horse in its defiance of the conventional demand for wholesale conjugal happiness in the last act, though an ample supply was conceded, was a little before its time. Perhaps in 1886 it still required the Ibsen controversy to clear the theatrical air for the acceptance of such a progressive step as the sacrifice of the curate's feelings and future domestic comfort to the artistic design and satirical purpose of the play. Had the hobby horse been produced at the present time, who knows but it might possibly have met with greater success. For though we may still quarrel about the definition of comedy, we do not still insist on every occasion 
that everybody shall be made absolutely and irrevocably happy before Cattenfall. Malcolm C. Salomon End of The Hobby Horse by Arthur Wing Pinero